Cool. Thanks for having me, Jason. Um, so my name is Jonathan, um, Jonathan Mitchell. I go by Botanic Chemist on Instagram. Um, basically botanic and chemist, but just one C in the middle. Um, I uh, live in Central Florida with my fiance. Uh, we actually own and are building a company um, that we call Ouroboros Laboratories. I'm wearing my shirt. Um, and what we do is we forage local plant material and we steam distill it and use a variety of old school extraction techniques, uh, perfuming techniques like enfleurage, where you infuse fat, uh, aromas into fat, and um, as well as making hydrosols and basically uh, aromatics for home and body made out of terpenes. Um, uh, we've been working on that for a little bit. Um, and what I've been doing for the past few years actually um, has been hash and rosin making. Um, I actually used to brew beer um, for a few years. I was doing that professionally here in Florida and the parallels between beer brewing and hash making are incredible. Um, food production, cleanliness, you know, using sanitary vessels for transfer, mixing and filtration. Um, so many awesome parallels. And basically I was doing that for a little while and um, it just, it just wasn't my passion. Um, you know, beer is great, but when you do it eight to 10 hours a day, it's, it's basically a glorified janitor, which is kind of what hash making is too, which is why I'm <laughs> saying they're so parallel. Um, and I basically, I, I got out of that and, um, use my, uh, chemistry and biology background to get into medical cannabis production here in Florida, uh, Florida, we only have a vertical medical market. So, you know, it's hundred percent seed to sale. Mm -hmm. Um, so actually I got hired, um, to do formulation, um, for like vape pens and tinctures and, uh, topicals and like meter dose inhalers, stuff like that. Um, and there came a point where we were looking at making hash and rosin out of our product. Um, smokable flour still wasn't online. Um, so, you know, concentrates were, um, but it was just ethanol at that point. So, you know, we were really trying to make something a little bit higher quality, something with a little bit, you know, better taste, a, a little bit more of a full spectrum effect, if you will. You know, we, I, I, your post the other day, I, I love that. I love that discussion. I love that little argument about yeah. full spec versus broad spec versus, you know, um, so it was, uh, it was really great that I actually got to m develop alongside, um, Robbie, uh, TH chemist OG on Instagram. Um, we got to develop the hash and rosin program basically from scratch. Um, and you know, there's, there's no, uh, formal technique, no SOPs that we were using at that point. Um, not even like standardized product. It was just like, okay, what can we take and what can we make? And, um, we, uh, I, I feel very fortunate and, uh, very excited about the fact that the, uh, city I live in Lakeland is in Polk County. If you've heard of Florida, you've heard of Grady Judd, probably our crazy cowboy sheriff. And, um, <laughs> You know, I've been in cannabis advocacy for the past, you know, 10, 12 years. And um, basically since I graduated high school and I could vote, um, uh, I attended a debate where it was Grady Judd and John Morgan, oh, um, which is, yeah, uh, you know, obviously <laughs> he's very pro cannabis. He calls himself the pot daddy, which is kind of ridiculous, but uh, <laughs> he's, he's very, he's very pro cannabis. Um, and, you know, at that, at that debate, you know, Grady Judd was saying basically it is illegal at that point. You know, it wasn't, we had no amendment to, um, had not been put on the ballot even at that point. It was like still being put, signatures gained, um, gathered. And he basically said, you know, okay, well, if you, the people vote and you decide this is what you want, I will uphold that law. And 
those words, like I, I carry them, I'll carry them with me forever because, you know, we went out and did a, a gained a lot of signatures. Yeah. We got amendment two on the ballot, um, which there's some, there's some language on there that is still like the, the language that was approved by voters was grow, extract, or sell. Uh, but what got approved was grow, extract, and, and sell. So yeah. that's what so, mandated the vertical integration. Correct. Yeah. So a lot of people think it's like uh, constitutionally incorrect, basically. Like people think that we should be able to reverse it. But obviously it's with million dollar, multi-million dollar players, billionaire players. Um, it's a lot harder to change those rules at first. And even with like some cities, I've, I'm not sure if it was Miami Um I, I think Miami doesn't allow dispensaries, but right around that Miami Dade area, um, one town was saying that they would give precedence to the existing mm. companies. Like if they had a limit on the amount of dispensaries, if the vertical operators already had the limit of 20, or even if they didn't quite hit it yet, if they want another one, they would be given the choice to open it first. I see. Um, yeah. Which, you know, like, I have got a lot of appreciation for vertical integration um, because of the ability to be so close to the actual process, you know, the growing, understanding what's happening, uh, coming from the clone room all the way to knowing what's happening when you're moving it from room to room, you know, yep. um, and uh, just really being able to have a, a tight hold uh that oversight on every part of the process um it's really beneficial i mean you know like single source raws in an extraction technically vertical would be single source right yeah but um not really because it's you know what we'd really like to consider that as the same grower the same extractor same the same marketer ideally. basically yeah exactly um mm -hmm. and you know so uh that's 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 very interesting um but it was, it was really awesome, though, that I got to help build this program because um, the rosin, the hash rosin that I made here uh, out in, uh, near, the, near the coast um, was the first legal rosin sold oh, wow. in my hometown. Wow, yeah. that's really cool. So literally like the first gram. And, you know, I think True Leaf technically beat us to the shelf. Mm -hmm. um when it came to the product uh but that's also because they hired blue river to come in with their sops and their techniques that were already proven and yeah. you know actual like skews and stuff packaging yeah they literally like they came and set it up for them you know so um but it's really great that we got to start this from scratch because you know, it was literally just from our personal research just well, and I was going to say, you, you learn so much more when you have to figure it out. And it's, you know, uh, a lot of times there's the chant of like, don't recreate the wheel. But sometimes, especially in emerging industries, um, it can be valuable to go through these headaches and challenges and things and dial things in yourself because you, you come to appreciate different aspects of the process, the technology and everything uh, differently than if right. a consultant comes in and sets it up and says, all right, follow these, you know, SOPs and, and just go uh, from a business perspective. That's nice and attractive, but um, right. you'll always learn more doing it yourself. Absolutely. There's, there's nuances, I mean, in everything, right. But, you know, especially to be learned in the uh, research and development, like the actual, yeah try it you know, or try it again you know like once you can really start to see those variables you can really start to iron them down and you know this it's it's one thing that you know i, I tell people all the time is you know take notes every yeah, single yep. thing you do in the lab take a note on it if it didn't seem that important you warmed it up with your hands for 10 seconds right. doesn't matter write it down yep. you know um, cause you can go back and then you can try to replicate that. You can see what the problem was whenever yeah. you are looking at your data down the road. And, you know, so it was, it was very, it was awesome. And, uh, literally just telling them what we needed, 
doing the research and being like, hey, I think, you know, if we use this machine as opposed to this ice machine, we're going to have a lot more throughput. You know, if we add this chiller here as opposed to using the filter over here with, you know, uh, city water or whatever, <laughs> get yeah. more water flow, stuff like that. You know, that was literally that some, you know, and of course, you know, there's definitely people that consultants that will can come in and set things up like completely ready for you to go. Um, but, you know, we literally had to figure it out all from scratch. And, you know, I flew out to um, I actually went to Oklahoma and I met Ken Wall, Ken, mm -hmm. Kenneth Wallace. Um, he's a big hash maker in Colorado, um, like one of the OGs of like rosin. And um, he put on a class with low temp plates, mm -hmm. um, you know, the rosin. Well, they were just making rosin presses for a while, but now they're actually they have like an automated washing machine. Oh, cool. Um, I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's called the Osprey. Um, it is by far like the most affordable automated washer you can get on the market. Um, high quality, like uh, ability to program in your settings, basically how far, how long you want it to spin at what speed and what direction nice. it can change it back up. I mean, you could do it seven seconds this way, 10 seconds this way, three seconds this way. You know, it's, it's, it's impressive. Um, and uh, basically they put on their, a class and, you know, I think it was like 300 bucks a person or something. And I flew out there. I had put it, you know, on my own dime and, mm -hmm. you know, working for large companies, it's, it's hard to get them to like see the value in paying, you know, six, 700 bucks for a trip <laughs> that, you know, whatever it's, it's hash making. I don't know. You know, it's like a lot of people that are, you know, like business owners and uh, the people making some of those decisions in the boardroom room are they're definitely not yeah. cannabis scientists yeah for the large 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 majority and you know you really have to like sell that idea to them and you know basically uh, i went out there and i did it and i came back and what i learned from ken Wall, you know like he literally did a hash class we were in a coffee shop and in oklahoma apparently you can smoke weed anywhere you can smoke a cigarette hmm. so wow. it is relaxed yeah and so we were at a coffee shop. Obviously, you can't smoke inside, but it was like a privately owned coffee shop. Yeah. We had the back door open. So we were seriously like dabbing at the tables. People were walking by, look at coffee, and they're walking by and they're like doing a double take, like coming back. What's going coming on? Coming back to the door. What's going <laughs> on? Are they they're smoking? And you know, he literally, they there's some growers, they brought some equipment, they washed it there, they had some dried hash already, they pressed it in front of us, and then we dabbed it all like freshly pressed. Wow. And, uh, it was great, man. Like I, I learned, I learned so much, um, just like those n nuances, you know, mm -hmm. like obviously we had, we had the process down, we were making product, but we were still like, how can we refine this more? How can we get this to be a better color to, uh, not that that matters more than anything, but you know, um, better aroma, better yield. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's, uh, I got to go and basically ask like, uh, and three, four pages basically worth of questions that I had. And nice. Ken Wall was just like answering them all, answering them all, answering them all. And, you know, I came back and I was basically able to increase the overall yield in the room by like, it was like four and a half or 5%. And, you know, so when you think like, oh, $800 or whatever, that's a lot of money. But when it comes to, right. you know, I was making like those, a lot of the photos that I uh, post are, you know, about two, 300 grams of rosin. Mm -hmm. And that's like an afternoon. That's a day of pressing, you know, obviously it's like a couple of days of washing right. afternoon of pressing. Um, but you know, when you are doing those big batches, um, you really have to be able to like know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Like, because when you are washing that much, if you mess up that entire right. wash, it's a lot of potential profit and product down the drain, you know? So I mean, increasing 300 grams by 5%, you know, like 15 yeah. grams, that's yep. on, on the retail side, you know, that could be $1,500 depending on, and it's very expensive here in Florida. Exactly. But, and then you know, the class so is paid for. Yeah. The class is paid for in an afternoon. Yeah. Like, you know, so, you know, I, I was able to do a lot of uh, like data presentation and collection and, uh, really show the differences in like 
what works and what doesn't not even what works and what doesn't but like hey check it out literally fifteen hundred dollars more a batch um and um it was great but the i had a two hour commute a day it was like one hour oh, each wow. way yeah and i drive a jeep so um not good gas mileage yeah i got a jeep um, too <laughs> yeah man what kind of jeep do you have oh i just have Love a patriot jeep. Okay. 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 Um, I have a, uh, it's a 2006, the two door unlimited. Oh, nice. It's a 4.0. Yeah. The engine blew up and I had to replace it myself. So I'll never get rid of that thing. <laughs> uh, too much blood, sweat and tears, Right. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, but so the commute was just too much. And, um, it was, uh, obviously, you know, like vertical industry, you know, depend, depending on your position, some of them don't pay that great, you know? Yeah. And even if you are, again, showing the data and being like, look, check it out, almost a quarter million dollars of product a week, you know? And, but, you know, obviously, like if something's just, it just wasn't, it just wasn't working out. So, you know, we parted ways. It was nice. It was, you know, uh, amiable. Um, it's just like, well, I, I have other things that I need to really focus on at this point. Yeah. Um, and I really felt like I did as much as I kind of could do there um, without, you know, literally being like in the board meetings, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, even explaining like the difference between why you should be given fresh frozen flour, like one plant that weighs, you know, <laughs> thousands of grams wet right. or uh, the same plant significantly less weight but the yield is significantly less as well and it, it's the, i feel like the hardest thing to express was really 1000 grams of dried plant material can end up weighing 150 to 200 grams yeah. and your yield from that can be you know five percent mm -hmm. versus 10 11 percent of the less weight it's the same plant though so right, like less right. hash at the end of the day but it was still like there's water in it like so you know <laughs> that uh it's, yeah it's uh it, that's it was frustrating in that in that regard but you know i basically i felt like i did as much as i could do and um i have been doing consultations um for the past uh pretty much a year and a half and um you know basically companies that even individuals, businesses or individuals that are looking to build their own hash and rosin program um, or even just like get training so they can easily land a job, yeah. um, you know, and just say that they have access to SOPs and, you know, uh, like best practices and data travelers. And um, I, so I've, I've been doing that and, you know, I've actually I've been really fortunate to have my my first consult client was in the UK. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, I have I have some clients in California. I have some clients in Maine, um, Mexico, and Oaxaca, um, as well as Puerto Rico. And cool. um, yeah, it's it's really great. There's there's another person I'm talking to. Um, they're in Thailand, and they have recently started. So, uh, yeah. um, legalization out there and um we are hopefully hopefully once their company is a little bit more launched i'll be able to help them out as well because i would love to travel out there yeah yeah super super cool there's a, a guy that he's come on the podcast a couple times with uh, the real seed company um they do a lot of uh land race sessions but they spend quite a bit of time in thailand and other areas i've heard some pretty cool stories from out there and a lot of what you said segues really well into one of the first questions that I had for you was, you know, as you were starting to, you know, let's say you, you came back from this class and you're trying to apply everything that you've learned, what were some of the main um, uh, takeaways, I guess, uh, you know, as you were kind of figuring these, these things out, I guess a better way to ask would be what were some of the road bumps that you hit along the way and and what did you learn from from those obstacles that you hit as you were trying to you know make the the process of rosin production um you know efficient and and high quality right um you know so definitely the first problem that 
you pretty much always run into with hash making, rosin making is for everybody. And, you know, I kind of start off my consults like this too, is when you are not 100% in control of that plant through its yeah. growth, harvest, yeah, either curing, drying, or storage process, if you're doing like fresh frozen, um, and you don't, like if you're not doing it yourself and you don't have the ability to directly train and have your procedures implemented for the harvest of that plant, it can dramatically decrease yield. Um, because, you know, as hash and rosin makers, we are not worried about the biomass. We are not worried about the weight of the flower. We are worried about that trichome coverage. Yeah. And, um, you know, about the relative size of the heads um, compared to your bags, um, you know, your filtration bags. And um, basically those heads are, they're so fragile that I'm sure everybody that has been into a grow, been into a trim room, they've seen the broomstick charas hash. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. The, the pen charas hash, you know, you literally pull it off and smoke it off a pen gross, but you know. Oh well, yeah, or like if you're um, trimming, if you're wearing gloves or any, or even your hands. I mean, yeah, right. You, the what you can just collect just from yeah, just from handling the plants and moving them around is is tremendous. Right, and you know, like working in a uh, like a large facility where you know I've seen it at so many large facilities where their you know veg is or their flower is you know halfway across the building, quarter mile mm -hmm. away from their extraction lab or their drying room. And, um, you know, when that happens, you can literally see the resin on the floor from yeah. where it's being pushed in the carts. You know, usually it's like hung up on yeah. one of those yeah. type of like clothing racks with a bag on it. So it doesn't get anything on it, but that doesn't stop everything from dropping. Yeah. And, you know, you can see it on the floor, like the ground has to be cleaned up with ethanol or yeah. ISO, you yeah. know? And, you know, so that was, that is like the first thing I always tell people and notice about you really have to train your, your growers, your harvesters that they're not just growing. If it, if it's, if it's, if it's being used for, you know, ethanol, BHO, hash, distillate, all that stuff. Um, you know, you have less of a little bit less say basically less, a. uh, specificity, you know, mm -hmm. um, in that when you are growing for hash and rosin, when you have people growing plants for hash and rosin for you, they need to be focused on resin production. Right. And that's, that's the not crop. weight. Yeah. Right. That's the crop. It's not the weight per light. You know, it's not the, how many eights you can get out of it. It's quite literally, it's all about the resin. And, um, if you are not growing for the resin and you are not gently treating those trichome heads, um, you know, being ginger with them, you're leaving them behind. You're literally leaving money on the table. And so, the, you know, the first thing I say is train your, train your growers, train your trimmers, um, go in there and do it yourself and show them yeah. how you want it done. And, you know, basically because a lot, a lot of the people in those positions are really just trying to like shuck and bucket, you know, yep. they're really just trying to, get it off, get it in. Even like, you know, a lot of the machine trimmers with yeah. the, the, uh, where it basically just pulls it off the stem. Um, again, it's just like, it's smashing those heads and, you know, so you could either lose those heads or what I think would be a little bit worse. I mean, they're about the same, <laughs> um, is when those heads get like physically damaged and they're still on the plant, like say it gets the bag, gets vacuum sealed. You know, yeah. if you're going to make hash, never vacuum sealed. Maybe pull the air out, but leave space between the walls. You exactly. Know? You can always stop it before it actually squeezes yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a seal. Yeah. You know? Um, so when you're doing that process, um, if you compact those heads or you put them in too hot or humid of an environment after you're harvesting, um, even stacking them just on top of each other, like on a, like a, a drying tray or rack or something like that, um, and those heads get stuck to each other, they are getting, they're gathering plant matter. They're usually holding on to their stock. And then those, those trichome heads that are, you know, possibly usually, you know, let's say a beautiful 91 micron 
trichome head. When that melts with another 90 micron head and a little bit of stock matter on it or plant matter, it's now stuck in your work bag at the top, which is either going in the trash if you're not drying it to make for edibles or it's yeah. going into edibles, um, which, you know, it's still good, but it's not hash, you know? It, right. And it's I mean, for people listening that are less familiar with the process that you're talking about. I want to back up a little bit and kind of explain. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've talked to. Um, like Marcus Richardson and a couple other people that mm -hmm. do a lot of like bubble hash stuff. So maybe folks are familiar with it, but can you describe um, for uh, lack of a better term, kind of the, the lay audience, um, this process that you're looking at, um, what kinds of microns of, of filtration bags are you talking about? And just what is that basic process of, of separating these trichomes and, and specifically the trichome heads um, away from the plant material? What does that look like? So, right. Um, so like you mentioned, uh, Marcus, uh, BC bubble man, yep. lots of people know him by that. You know, he does hash church on YouTube. I've been following Marcus for years, like over a decade now. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I mean, he's been, he's been putting out the info, you know, he's had the, the bubble bags he's yep. had, um, you know, like equipment for people to use. And he's taught them how to use that equipment. It's, a, it's phenomenal. Like it's the perfect strategy, you know, it's, basically an open source introduction to hash making and, you know, old school cannabis concentrates. So, um, you know, there's, an, there's a bunch of other like big names like, uh, Frenchie cannoli, um, Mila Jensen, Mila hash queen, um, Nika T. Uh, there's so many others, you know, like it's hard to remember all of them, but and bubble man, you know, those are some, those are some real big names. And basically, the it's a modern uh, adaption to old school hash making. So what used to be done uh, in the Middle East is, you know, the Hindu Kush regions and um, where these plants are growing prolifically and naturally, you know, where they where they originate from. Um, the obviously exporting a illegal plant matter that is biomass in you know large volume for right. for its uh for its compound content um you know it was very hard to smuggle and you know basically it, its popularity came about because of its uh increased effects versus flower and its ability to be moved rather easily you know yeah. um and you see that with a lot of stuff you see that with a lot of um drug compounds, you know, a lot of people may say, they want to argue that weed isn't a drug. It is, you know, caffeine right. is, you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. literally, like I have some plants out in my yard. Right. I have plants out in my yard right now. I'm looking at, they're called Cedar rhombifolia. They're, um, I think it's called Indian jute or Indian hemp. And, mm -hmm. uh, it actually has, um, ephedrine in it. Yeah. And, you know, you can literally pick it up, eat a little leaf. It's like a cup of coffee. That's a drug, you know, but, um, and, you know, no such thing as bad drugs or good drugs, like Hamilton Morris says, you know. Um, but basically, you know, as as it became concentrated, there was different techniques. And, um, you know, a, a big way was to make, it's called hand charas, where you can take the actual mm -hmm. bud and rub it between your hands. And then the sticky resin can be peeled off and collected and rolled into a ball. Um, Obviously, there's gonna be skin cells in that too. Um, <laughs> All sorts of stuff. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> not the not the most modern uh, method. Um, but then there is also methods where the uh, plant matter would be brought into like a shed and like a little mini you know workspace, and then they would have silk blankets, silk sheets, mm -hmm. and watching like videos of people do this, um, it's very impressive where basically, you know, multiple people will take the sheet and be bouncing it up and down, holding the different sides of it with the plant matter on top. And they'll basically, they'll bounce it and they'll take a little scoop and they will literally be able to separate, you know, the trichomes are falling through the silk and they're literally like separating the, the wheat from the chaff, you know, <laughs> basically. Yep. And, um, you know, from that point, that resin could be collected. That is dry sifting, technically. Um, but when it comes to bubble hash, um, and ice water extraction is another, uh, term for it. The idea is that 
on the cannabis plant, all, all the active compounds are created in those trichome heads. And like that is, you know, obviously, you know, the chemical factory of the plant. Mm -hmm. And not to say that there's nothing in the rest of the plant, but that's where the good stuff is. That's our concentration. That's what we want. And so as hash makers, we are really trying to, and you know, like you said, there's the, the full trichome with the stalk and the head. And what we really just want is that head. So when we are using um, ice water, bubble hash, the reason it's called bubble hash is because when you mix it in the water, it makes like a bubble broth from like the protein and stuff in the actual plant. And when you are basically, sorry, the, the way that you get those trichome heads and just isolate those trichome heads, it's not technically extraction. It's yeah. considered mechanical isolation, um, mechanical separation. And the idea is that since, you know, people know that cannabis is, uh, fat, oil, alcohol soluble, you know, yeah. you can make it into butter, you can infuse it into alcoholic beverages, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that is nonpolar with water, um, being a polar solvent and, you know, people are like, Oh, it's not solventless because it has water. Water is a universal <laughs> solvent, it's like, but not in this case, not it's, in this it's case. More, yeah. No, it's more of a lubricant. It's more of a, it's a, it's a physical carrier. I was about to so say, yeah, it, it's providing more mechanical action than, than chemical. Correct. Correct. And not to say that, um, there is no interaction, you know, right. um, I've definitely seen like the more monoterpene fruity aromatic strains. You can smell those terps in the wash and well, it smells great. I would assume, try it. I would assume okay. any, uh, like terpenes with hydroxyl groups, maybe, uh, potentially be caught in the water, uh, more than others, things like that. Exactly. So, um, with that being said, um, when you are suspending the plant matter in ice water and if people call it whole plant fresh frozen, which is kind of a misnomer, yeah. um, because you're not using the fan leaves, you're not using the stem, you're not using the roots. Yep. Um, you are using the sugar leaves. You're basically just using anything with appreciable trichum coverage. Um, and you know, the idea since it won't dissolve in water and since those trichome heads are actually a like waxy lipid layer, basically a, a waxy cuticle is what people call it. And, you know, basically that head, the oil inside the resin inside is where the compounds are, you know, that is basically rosin. Um, it will be rosin. And so the idea is that by suspending this plant matter in this ice water, those waxy heads become hard in the water. You know, they just like most fats, they get cold, they solidify and um, it makes it stable. So, you know, maintaining a low room temperature as well as proper water temperature, never exposing that bud to warm temps. Yeah. Um, when you're in between harvest and uh, extraction or isolation, um, it it really benefits the overall process. You know, like I said, those heads don't get stuck to each other. And when you, you can either do it with ha like by hand washing um, mm -hmm. or you can do it with like an automated machine. Um, there's everything from like basically like apartment building washing machines. You make like plastic ones. There's stuff like Bubble Magic and um, other, you know, brands that have been basically repurposed washing machines, but you can buy these washing machines as opposed to spending three, 200, 300 bucks on the thing with the cannabis sticker on it. Yeah. You can just go on Amazon well, and buy like automated washer. Well, and I remember back in the day, there were all of these um, sort of uh, manuals for converting uh, right. like your old washing machine into something like this. And it's been funny seeing the industry mature that now these are just real products now. <laughs> it's not right. just, you know, taking an old washing machine you happen to have and trying to uh, retrofit it into something you can make cash with. Like They just make them that way. Correct. Now. Yeah, that's cool. Exactly. And, you know, they make them to be easy to clean because obviously resin is sticky. Um, and you... If it's not easy to clean, you have to use too many solvent. It just yeah. gets expensive. Not even necessarily that you're like putting solvents in your solventless, but you know it can just get expensive. 
Um, so basically when you are, when that plant matter is suspended, it's been frozen and it can be either there's, there's so many different subsets of hash and rosin, right? Yep, so, you yeah. know, there's the dry, there's the charis that we were talking about. There's the dry sift, which is using basically just gravity and filtering based on size. Um, and the ice water extraction, you can also use either dried cured plant matter mm -hmm. um, or you can use what is called fresh frozen live rosin and again that's kind of a misnomer because once you kill the plant once you <laughs> chop it down it's dead right uh, there's somebody i follow rosin bell on ig she called it dead rosin just being <laughs> goofy about it but I mean, it kind of you know it's slightly more accurate like just murdered rosin right um, yeah yeah moments and after the <laughs> after the fall moments after dead rosin <laughs> and um so you know basically um you can either take that dried plant matter or that fresh frozen and there's a couple different camps you know there's some people that think that like dried ice water hash is poor quality Mm -hmm. Um, and there's some people that, you know, and only want to smoke live rosin and there's some people that, I mean, myself included, I love live rosin, but there is definitely something detectable there. That's not in the, in the dry, you know, it's a little bit more vegetal. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you can not necessarily like, you know, picking up on chlorophyll, but like, Ooh, that's harsh, you know, xanthophyll, something like that. It's just like, there are, are obviously water soluble compounds that, since the plant hasn't been dried and that you know yeah. water hasn't evaporated and you know the sugars haven't made their full conversion um there's there still are some you know probably sugars and some other things in that live rosin now the yield is typically significantly higher with live rosin mm. and you know that's because as the plant dries yeah it compacts you know yeah. and we are trying to get everything inside um so the differences between those two is basically just the harvest, you know, dry harvest, both have to be frozen before they're washed. Um, but then you can take either of those products. Like I said, you freeze it. Um, 12 hours is usually sufficient. Um, but you know, if it's sealed to the environment, um, you know, no oxygen or, uh, humidity exposure, it can last, you know, a couple months in the, in the deep freeze, you know, obviously the fresher, the better. Yeah fresh frozen live rosin if it's two months old it's like kind of freshly frozen dead rosin you know right yeah it gets into this weird weird area yeah fresh not so yeah. fresh sort of live not really live resin <laughs> right you know there's usually people don't um like quantify that you know yeah. qualify that like on their packaging or anything um but you know if it's if it's a good product it's a good product so after you have your plant matter, your starting plant matter, it's at the, the point that you wanted to harvest it based on, you know, the appearance of your trichomes, cloudy, you know, clear versus cloudy versus amber. Hash makers like to use a little bit of amber, mm -hmm. mostly cloudy. Um, but if you harvest when they're nearly translucent, um, you get like this phenomenally colored, like very light, basically like manila. Um, a uh, very, very, very light color. Um, but again, you know, like that is not the end all be all of rosin if it's a little bit sure. dark, you know? Yeah. And that starts and, to kind of come it, down it, to personal taste, I would assume. Right, right, absolutely. And, you know, like, I mean, there's some people that loved age hashish and yeah. that stuff, it looks like like black tar heroin or something, you know, yeah, like yeah. A, like mud, you know, it can, it compared to rosin, it's not as aesthetic, but that's, I mean, I think it is because I've, I smoked like actual hash, like yeah. actual charis hash way before I even like before rosin was yeah. out, you know, um, before it's even a thing. And, you know, so it's a preference. It is about preference. And, you know, if it's too translucent, it's actually immature and, you know, like the full cannabinoid conversion hasn't taken place. And, you know, there's even something to be said about, that the decarbing process of cannabis mm -hmm. while it's on the plant in storage yep. and you know just like degradation like there's there's yep. something to be said That's about you know there's a terpene i don't know too much about it but like hashanine yeah um yeah. you know it's like a terpene found in like aged hashish and um you know so preference 100 um 
but they're still best practices. You know, when you are getting it to the more cloudy, slightly less amper, you know, 20% or so maybe, um, you are getting that, you know, full strength, you know, for basically the plant's full potential. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I, I really prefer that as opposed to early harvest or mm-hmm. too late to harvest. Um, so I know there's balance in all everything. Um, but basically when you are taking this either live or dried matter, um, and you suspend it in this ice water, it, like I said, those trichomes become, become very brittle and very easy to remove off the plant. So again, it's not a solvent that's actually pulling them off. Right. It requires a physical agitation. So you can either use, you know, people have used like trash cans, you know, mm-hmm. HDPE, basically um, just food grade plastics, yeah. um, obviously a brand new trash can, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. food grade extraction vessel. Yeah. Um, and, you know, other people have uh, like uh, modified uh, peer pressure does like their large brutless um, mm-hmm. hand mixing thing. Um and then, like I said, low temp, I'm actually um, starting to work with low temp a little bit more. Um, and um, they have the Osprey, which is, you know, like I said, automated. It has all of these settings basically that you can input. And again, taking notes, being like, uh, we ran it way too long the last time and we can yeah. see that it's green, you know. Um, so at, at that point, either using hand agitation or uh, automated agitation, those trichome heads um and you know this is where like phenol hunting like strain selection is very important you can have the uh, either like much too short you know it's a bad example but you know let's let's say the trichome head is about as thick as the stalk sure and it's a, a very short stalk um it's going to take a lot of agitation to like, break yeah. it off you know like i kind of display it like this you know like it's going to take a lot more mm-hmm. to just easily knock that off as opposed to a slightly longer one where that head can easily go boop and just fall right off, but not too long of a trichome uh, stalk where any bit of agitation is just going to go and take the whole. That makes sense. Yeah. Give you the stalk and everything. And then like, in case people aren't aware uh, that are listening, cannabis produces multiple types of trichomes and there are some cultivars that produce more what are called sessile um, capitate glandular trichomes, which don't have stalks, which um, m- creates a unique challenge, I would imagine, for hash makers versus a more traditional yes. cultivar that is predominantly uh, capitate stalk trichomes. Right, absolutely. And, you know, so again, circling back to that, that same first problem is really having the um, control over knowing what that pheno, how it performs, yeah. um, what it looks like under the scope, you know, actually being like up close and intimate with the plants really pays off. Um, you know, like you can literally look at something. I learned this from, from Ken Wall. Um, you can do a test wash where you can just take like a mason jar with ice water, put your butt in it, let it soak, and then give it a handshake. And you can see the trichomes um, at the bottom. And you can, you know, obviously that's a little bit qualitative. You can't like measure that out, filter that out. But, you know, you can compare it to like something that washes well. You know, you can do them side by side, be like, oh, I know the slurricane washes. Um, I'm going to try this Gorilla Blue or something, you know. And um, so being able to have that control is, is very, very, very important because you don't want to wash those yeah. short, short stocks, you know, um, and you don't want to wash the long stocks and you don't want to wash something with too dense of trichome coverage because you're not going to be able to get in there as easily, mm-hmm. or they might be sticking to each other yeah. or, um, you know, in, there's there's basically a, a lot of things that and you know growing conditions matter too obviously like one pheno can do very very well yeah. in this growing environment with the right size heads and this one like it doesn't notes again take the notes and so basically um you know the 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 difference is that um depending on that yield and depending on the strain um you will be collecting those heads through a variety of micron filters, bubble bath 
This is what people call them. And the idea is after you have agitated the plant matter and you know, again, it's cold, it stays cold the whole time. Um, typically there's either like a drain valve at the bottom. People still do like lift the bucket and move it. I don't recommend that just because you can dump it all over the floor yeah. Yeah. and waste everything. And water's 10 pounds a gallon. So, you know, if you're doing a 20 gallon mixing vessel, that's, that's a lot of weight. You can hurt yourself, you know, um, it's best to automate liquid moving and liquid movement and, but you don't want too many pumps. You don't want to damage those heads. So gravity filtration is typically preferred. Um, so after those heads have been isolated, um, and there's, uh, again, there's a couple different, uh, schools of thought, uh, about the method. So you can either put the plant matter into the mixing vessel with water and ice just open yeah. or you can put it in uh they're called work bags yep. basically work bags work cubes uh, they're basically zippered bags that you can fill with plant matter it's 220 microns so it's the, the not that big but you know it's the largest it's the largest actually i have a bag right here yeah um Might as well. Yeah. So this is a um, ice extract cube, and you know yeah, it's no. basically it's in a, it's in a cube shape. It's got the zipper up top, and then you know the holes are pretty big. You can you can see through it pretty yeah, well. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that matter is put in here, and then the uh, plant matter is agitated. So you know either like I said, it's all together mixed yeah. up, agitated or it's put in one of these, which allows the plant matter to stay behind, um, but allows the trichome heads, to fall stalks out. pass through, some plant matter falls through, but this is your work bag. This is really just trying to get the heads out for you to be able to then further filter that, I call it hash slurry. Yeah. Um, and um, so basically at that point, um, either, you know, depending on your volume, um, and depending on your equipment, you know, like, uh, Osprey has really nice, big, wide valves and, uh, you know, like a false bottom and it's very open. You can get in and scoop stuff out as opposed to, you know, being maybe that large of an opening and right. having to get in all the nooks and crannies. Um, and if you need to clean so, it or whatever. Right, right. Exactly. And, you know, I clean, I clean all my equipment after every single use. Um, good, good. and every single time. And um, a basically, when you have that hash slurry, you can then run it through the secondary filtration process, which is then separating those trichome heads and plant matter based on micron size. So um, I don't have I don't have like my bucket set up or anything in here. This is this is actually my uh, going to be my new office. Uh, we just moved into this house. Yeah. So I finally have an office, like a dedicated workspace. Uh, super excited. That's a good thing. Um, yeah. But it is, dude, it's so good. And uh, basically, well, that hash slurry then needs to be further filtered. So at this point, after it has come out of that 220 micron bag, um, everything is going to be smaller than 220. So yeah. it's yeah. 219 all the way down to you know 0 0.1 microns, whatever the smallest bit of matter that you have. Um, and what a lot of people will do is, and again, depending on the product that you're making, if you're just trying to make like a uh, full melt hash, you know, to like dab hash, um, which, you know, has to be very clean for it to be dabbable, you know, full melt implies that the majority, large, large majority of the hash is larger trichome heads with a minimum of, uh, wax material uh and contaminant that will not leave any char behind on your on your banger or your puffco or whatever um and basically um either if you were trying to make that full melt hot or you were trying to make rosin or even like vape pens you know solventless vape pens um depending on your cultivar depending on what you're going for um you can then take that 219 that one micron to 219 mm -hmm. micron and then run it through a another set of filters so a lot of people will take the bubble bags which again is basically it's very similar to this yeah. um but it has an open top some are full mesh some only have a mesh bottom um some That's are obviously cool. made much better than others i do like ice extract bags a lot um i like i really like them 
because the actual entire like eight bag set, um, each the, bo the bag at the bottom is the longest. So as you stack the bags uh -huh. in, a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter. So yeah. it's not all of the filters sitting on, you know, yep. they're like yep. slightly. They've got separated. some spacing. So it just allows, yeah. yeah, they got some spacing that allows for quicker filtration. Um, so I, I like this a lot. Um, and they've, they've stood up to everything. They've stood up to, you know, 10 times, 10, 10, uh, times a week washing, like not 10 cycles <laughs> like and sets of multiple cycles, you know? Um, and, uh, pretty much chemical resistant. You don't want to be using like ethanol or it's, it's best to use ISO, um, on these bags. If you like, and just use it on the mesh, if you mm -hmm. want to get it out. Um, and also never use hot water, only cold water to clean, only cold water to make hash. If you use warm water to even try to like push heads through, they're just going to melt. They're going to stick to this bag mm -hmm. and yeah. it's, you're going to have up. a bad time. Yeah. Yeah. Just clogged up. Yeah. And you know, so basically you will then filter the that hash so most bags uh most bag sets go from 25 is the lowest um and then there's a couple different bag manufacturers that like change the microns by a very small amount so 25 and then it's usually either 43 or mm -hmm. 45 um two micron difference like i mean who knows there could be a really good application for that but you have to have the data you yeah know? exactly <laughs> you have to be able to look at those plants and know the size of the trichome heads. And there's one guy, um, well, his page in particular, Schwale, hmm, S-H-W-A-L-E. You should follow him. He's on IG. Um, he works with Farmhouse Studio Genetics. Okay. And um, they, like, he's an awesome macro photographer. And um, he's coined the term weak neck trichome. Oh. Um, because they've found some genetics that basically that connection point between mm -hmm. the stalk and the head seems to be, uh, the theory is that the uh, terpenes uh, right at the base of the head are acting as a uh, partial solvent to mm -hmm. the actual like wax layer on the trichome, which gives it a um, quite literally like a caved in yeah. weak neck. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's awesome for hash makers. What one that he's been working on sugar coat. Um, that's, that's pretty much, they noticed it with some other strains, like the lineage of that, but that's like their first like awesome washer. Um, but he takes awesome macro photos and he's actually, um, like comparing, like using like a micron grid and I was gonna uh, other methods of measurement. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, macro photography up close, stacked images, stuff like that. And he's, they're able to like, they're getting the data on what these average head sizes are, um, which is super hard to do, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, after it's extracted, it's very, very hard to do, you know, stuff changes after that process. You Absolutely. Know, like damaged yeah. and, well, and I was going to say, you don't know what. based on everything that you've been saying, it makes total sense why so many hash makers get into macro photography. Uh, because you're yep. thinking about so many different things or, about these trichomes. Uh, and, of course, people probably think about color and stuff. But when you're thinking about things like, yeah, how is the head sitting on the stalk? And how can we think about that? How long is that stalk in relation to the size of the, all of these little things? Uh, some of which I've thought about, but some of which I hadn't really thought about. Like the uh, the length of the neck I, I or the stalk, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, but it makes perfect sense why mm -hmm. so many of you are so, so into macro photography. So many hash makers become macro photographers. And it's great because there's so many amazing, especially like we, I know. we've talked about even offline, talked about IG, just how amazing it's been for the cannabis community. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but the photos you can see, just the detail you can see in these trichomes is incredible. It is. It really is. It's beautiful. I know there's anytime I even see a page and there's a lot that look very similar enough, you know, like a black background, mm -hmm. the, the stacked zeroing images. And, um, but even if they look like exactly the same, I'm like, yeah, follow. I love right. It. Still. I love yeah. it. Like, <laughs> Just that kind of looks like that guy's work. I like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, so, um, you know, all those little things really make a difference. So when you are further, refining that hash, if you will, mm -hmm. um, further separating it by micron size. So it goes 25, 43 or 45. 
Um, and then it usually goes either like 70 or 73. Um, and then uh, one, 90, and then it usually goes 120, and then 160, and then 180, and then 220, um, which is that work bag. So again, you don't you don't need to use like the zippered work bag. Yeah. You can mix by hand and then pour it through like a 220, like a large mm -hmm. work bubble bag as opposed to a work cube. Um, and then, you know, you separate that plant matter, which will then be, it should be kept cold and it could be put either to, if you have a, a second washer or even if you just have like a vessel with like ice and water, just to keep it cold. Yeah. You know, if your room, if you're hashing in a lot of like hash makers that are doing it at scale already are working in like either a, a walk-in cooler right. or you can modify, you know, like your own, uh, window unit with the, it's called st the IG is store it cold, but it's called a cool bot. <laughs> and, you know, it basically hijacks the, uh, the temperature controller within the, uh, AC unit. And it basically just, you know, monitors the temperature and it turns off and on at the right point without short cycling your compressor. Yeah. Um, so I think it's only like 200 bucks. It's really, it's an amazing cool. huh. piece of equipment. You can do all sorts of stuff. You can literally make like meat, uh, like hunting trailers, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, to out in the yeah, woods yeah, yeah, for yeah. veggies, you know, root cellars, all that kind of stuff. Um, wine cellars, fermentation, everything. And, um, so usually you'll be working in a really cold room anyways. You know, what, what I recommend is like really 40 at the lowest, because once you start getting closer to, you know, freezing yeah. temperatures, you are going to be creating some ice in your bucket, which you don't want everything to freeze together and make one mass, you yeah. know, or yeah. you're just basically pushing an ice cube around in your cup. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and like, so really you don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, so like, you know, really 40, 45, um, up to like 60 is really about like the warmest you want to go. Um, 50 is like perfect though. Like yeah. 50s, you know, a lot of people can stand that with like just a light jacket. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't freeze the, the actual wash vessel. Um, and you know, obviously you can spend more time in there not getting as cramped up and stuff. Um, but you know, so that, that temperature, you are keeping it cold, but it's still a good idea to, after you have separated the hash slurry from the plant matter out of that 220, put that plant matter back in the water and in the ice, keep it cold. And then from that point, usually the, like I said, the, the bags are stacked on top of each other, mm -hmm. either in like one large bucket setup, or some people will like cut the tops off of buckets to use it as like a, a ring, you know, like a mm -hmm. structural ring, yeah, basically yeah, yeah. just yeah. to to cut them together down. just to, right like just you know the top like four inches or so of the bag just to tighten the bag around that around that uh hoop that circle if you will and then stack them all together so basically um what people are typically collecting so that 220 like i said it's plant matter that 180 is usually um either food grade or trash um and, you know, hopefully that 180 bag isn't too full. Um, you know, hopefully you're not seeing a lot of heads that yeah. are stuck together, stuck to plant matter, stuff like that. If so, you have a problem in the harvest and the yep. growing part, and you need to take a couple steps back. Um, at the 160, um, that bag actually, again, depending on the, on the, on the strain, um, some strains have really massive heads, you know? Mm -hmm. So you could get some good stuff in that 160. More often than not, though, that's going to be a food grade bag. Um, it's going to have a lot less plant matter. It's going to have a pretty decent cannabinoid content. Usually, um, I think the analytics that I've done is like still around like 20% cannabinoids. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously it's not like the 70, 60, 70% of like pure hash. Yeah. Um, but, you know, cause obviously there's more plant matter in there. So uh, there's the 160, um, I think people also might use like a 150. So that's kind of like um, Keef in a way, like kind of what people right. really just think of as Keef. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, hash is very much um, what people consider Keef. And, you know, Keef is typically, that's what you get at the bottom of the grind. Right. Or that's, you know, that's the more traditional usage of the word, right? I mean, I don't you'll really have, know. You'll I have a actually... little bit of plant material 
trichomes, right. a little bit of stuff mixed in that usually has kind of a greenish, light green, yellow kind of absolutely color, and yeah, not as absolutely. not as pure. It usually melts, yeah, like it sticks to your fingers. You know, you make a little ball with it, um, but yeah, you know, that's that's basically um, trimmer, trim grade keef, grinder grade keef, uh, uh, farmers grade um, hash. And, um, which that can be absolutely taken and further refined through a dry sift method, which basically, as opposed to using bags, you push it over a screen, which leaves plant matter on top. The screen in the middle is, uh, the holes are small enough to hold the heads on top, but the holes are large enough to allow stalks and other mm. bits of small plant matter through to the bottom. Um, so you can further refine that. And there's people like a uh, Cuban grower. Uh, he's uh, super big into it. He makes like some of the nicest full melt hash um, from dry sift. And it's a, it's a painstaking process. You know, there's um, like modified environments, you know, like, uh, like pressurized uh, vessels. Oh, I see. Yeah. Static. Yeah. yeah. Um, even um, what's the, uh, I always forget the name of the word. The, uh, uh, when you're using sound waves oh uh, ultrasound yeah it's called like zymatics or something like that i forget exactly what it's called um like like it's, basically it's doing cool. sonication right exactly um so you can use that as well um there's all there's all sorts of like techniques like little nuances for the dry sifting very painstaking definitely like an artisan product not yeah. a super scalable thing at, at this point at least unless you have a lot of like talented people um but you know so yeah basically hash is keef um and um when you uh take that so that 160 bag uh usually has like i said food grade and then the usually the next bag size down is 120. Mm -hmm. um so there's a lot of awesome heads in here um so all of these bag sizes you know if it says um, 120 on it, that means the holes are 120. So mm -hmm. items that are 120 will pass through, right. but 121 all the way up into the next bag size. So in 160, so it'd be 160 or, you know, 159, but they will, 160 will pass through. Yeah. So it's 121 to 160. Um, and then the next bag size down is the 90 U bag, um, mm -hmm. which a lot of people call the full melt. A lot of people uh call it like the head stash you know and um you know we had this i joined in on your on your post on ig the other yeah. day talking about like full spectrum and um you know it's definitely like slightly misleading depending on how it's being used um because you know like a full spectrum what what i take that to mean is you know rosin hash it's already technically full spectrum when it comes to cannabinoid content you know right it, it is that can it is the trichome where the chemicals are made it is literally just like taking the factory and you know isolating it, using it and that's why people like and me personally i like hash and rosin so much because it is a really accurate reflection right. of the plant matter um as opposed to you know and nothing against BHO or like hydrocarbon extracts or anything. There's awesome stuff that can be mm -hmm. made. Um, but with that solvent recovery process and heat and vacuum, mm -hmm. um, you are degrading and destroying and volatizing some of those uh, yep. desirable compounds. Um, so, you know, like hash rosin is very, very, very similar to what the effects from the plant would be. And um, when you are taking this, uh, like separating the hash based on micron size, um, I would really only consider, like if it was labeled for it to be called full spec, um, for it to have basically all of the desirable range of trichome heads in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, all the way from, if you have nice looking heads in the 25 bag, it can be all the way from 26 micron to, like I said, all the way to 160 micron. That would be like full, full spec. And a lot of people would consider that a lower grade. Um, and it can be if it's over agitated, you know, sure. if, yeah. if you are not being ginger enough, doing mm -hmm. minimal agitation times, um, you know, you can absolutely make that a lower quality product. Um, 
mixed micron is another term that you know would imply that some of those bags are used but not every single bag um because you know what does happen pretty often it's usually just like in recreational markets um where that 90u bag that 73 mm -hmm. uh up to or 74 up to you know 120 micron um is pulled aside for either like the head stash or mm -hmm. it's sold at a premium um yeah. and nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with like smoking isolated trichome heads based on size but if you are marketing to consumers everybody wants the 70 and 90 you you know right. if unless you are dramatically decreasing your prices on that mixed micron which doesn't have the full melt heads in it like really you know given like a, a an accurate deal like a, a fair deal for that um, it should be called mixed micron, you know? Yeah. Um, but if you have people that want it, you know, like you, some people are able to pay the premium and get the, the really, really good stuff. And, and not to say that the 70 and 90 are better than the right. 120. Yeah. You know, um, yes, necessarily. Um, but you know, it's, it's just slightly misleading. So, you know, that's something I feel like as the terminology, more people are familiar with with it and using the terms regularly and there's a little bit more confusion that mm -hmm. needs clarification i think we'll start seeing that and like you know people hash makers labeling their hash and raws and with the specific microns yeah I've, I've started to see things go that way and i was really glad that you commented on that post because that's the type of thing i wouldn't think to point out you know that that in the world of of true like hash making like you know true solventless hash making um, there's this other dynamic of, of the micron bags and yeah, what's being collected, what's mixed together, what are people actually exposed to? And so we have this whole discussion about full spectrum, broad spectrum in the context of really more or less solvent based extracts, you know, cause it's really a lot of that discussion's happening more in the hemp space around, um, right. you know, ethanol based extracts and CO2 extracts and distillates primarily. Uh, but then when you, when you zoom out and you stop focusing on that and you think, well, okay, when you start looking at bubble hash, rosin, all these things that involve mechanical separation, which as a, as a pinned side note, one thing I want to make sure to talk about is some misconceptions around rosin and that there are different ways to make rosin and, and what you're describing of filtering out trichome heads before you ever go to rosin um, not everyone does it that way. So I just want to like put a pin in that, that like there's, there's right. different ways to go about this. So it can get even more complicated. Um, yeah. because when you start talking about like putting plant matter under a, under a press and stuff, you know, there's different dynamics. Um, but this, this idea Absolutely. of a mixed, mixed micron, um, that's a really important thing that I, I was really stoked that you, you mentioned, cause I just never would have thought to, to uh to point that out but absolutely it's this other layer of complexity that is really unique to to the the solventless side of of extraction right and you know in just because hash making is like hash is the oldest cannabis concentrate um you know i mean it's it's thought it's been suggested by different scholars that you know incense used in temples mm -hmm. of the bible are hash you know yeah. Um, combined with, you know, maybe opium or other, right, other plants, you know, other plant matter, yeah. exactly, you know, but it, it, without a doubt, it was able to uh, communicate a spiritual meaning and effect. Um, and, you know, so it, it is the oldest. And, but at the same time, it's like the one that needs the most refinement, as far as bring it into like the public spotlight and you know getting people really educated about the differences like everything we're saying between hand rubbed dry sifted static separation ice water extraction um sonication you know like all of these methods are different ways to get those heads um and just uh, you know honestly like rosin is a rel relatively new thing you know mm -hmm. um over you know the past de decade basically um you know like frenchy cannoli has done the like taking up putting boiling water hot water in like a wine bottle and then like rolling yeah. uh, the hash in between like the cellophane you know, and um you know getting it to like cure and age in that like his cannoli way um and 
basically, you know, when uh, it's it's kind of hit like the limelight, you know, there's uh, one guy, uh, Nika T, um, he was like super big in, you know, like popularizing Raws and like online, uh, uh, I always forget, soil grown solventless. Um, I want to make sure I'm saying it right. He like, he's also a, a huge um, like inspiration for the rosin community. I just want to make sure I'm saying this right. Yeah, totally. Um, and it feels um, like it was like yeah, uh, soil grown salt on this. I'm trying to remember when uh, we really started to see a lot of rosin start to come through the door when I was doing a lot of commercial testing. But I want to say it was like maybe. 20 i mean really started to see trickle in in 2015 2016 is where we really started to see it you know where companies were starting to focus on that like beyond experimentation they're like no we're gonna have a rosin company you know I, and we started to see some of that so it, it and that was it, granted you know what i see is just my my lens but that was in oregon you know through um the medical and, and adult use programs you know that we were tackling there but yeah it is does seem uh fairly new at least in the in the way that that we see it now because i think like 2014 or so uh, people were doing the um uh hair curling iron uh yeah. methods you know like that was the first time i ever tried yeah. making rosin destroying uh, uh, rosin uh, and <laughs> yeah destroying those yeah. irons to step on yeah. them and get as much pressure as you can uh, it's, yeah, it's evolved, literally. They're lot. definitely not made for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, really, it really, truly has. It really, truly has. And you know, like uh, some of the first rosin that was being pressed um, was like being pressed in like coffee filters. Mm, you yeah. know, um, and I mean it works. Uh, obviously, they're made out of paper and they mm -hmm. have low tensile strength, and you know they they can uh, have a blowout, which is you know what you call it when you're pressing in the bag bus open um but you know that was kind of like the one of the first ways of doing it and you know the idea was that obviously when you have hash like we like i said those those heads they're a waxy mm -hmm. membrane but it's filled with oil and you know if you can leave that head behind and just squeeze out the oil obviously you can't pop each one and like yeah squeeze yeah. it out um but the method was developed in that like if it's filtered and heat pressure is applied, that oil can come out. And, um, you know, I'm obviously, you know, I feel like, you know, inventions, people have, like, as humans, I really kind of do feel like we are tapped into this, like, creative energy that it's like, uh, like a network. Yeah. Like, you know, we're kind of connected to this network. And, you know, like, inspiration comes from so many sources. It's not just, like, one idea that you had that you developed everything. <laughs> right, It's, yeah. you, know, some, you know, so many other things that came before it. And guaranteed that one out of the seven-plus people on this planet might have seen the same thing and have some of the same ideas. Um, like, Bicycle Day, you know, um, mm -hmm. the first intentional LSD trip that Dr. Hoffman took. Um Last year for bicycle day, uh, bicycle day, uh, bicycle day um, <laughs> my Florida's coming out. Um, right, yeah. <laughs> if you keep talking that way, my Mississippi will come out. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, hell yeah, man! We'll do it. We'll do right. it south, southern hashing. Um, but um, basically, um, whenever uh, like last year, we uh, made an art piece on bicycle day. Um, which like my fiance has been painting on, it was like a high times magazine clipping of our nice. Hoffman's face. And she did like pointillism yeah. art on it. And, uh, like we took it up, uh, took a photo of it. You know, she's like, I, I think I'm done with this. I think I'm finally done. And it was like, we were doing art that night, last bicycle day. And we just started messing with like a video editing app. And I was just like changing the saturation of like the color saturation of yeah. the image. And it was very psychedelic um and we're like oh my god like we have to put this out for other people to see it's awesome like we were seeing like animals and mountains and like just the way that like the color is fading from some parts of the photo and other mm -hmm. parts were like very very trippy for lack of a better word yeah, and yeah. last bicycle day maps um you know multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies like you mentioned you're gonna be interviewing rick doblin which is awesome um 
they posted a piece of artwork that somebody did that's basically like the same thing like a yeah. photo of albert hoffman's face changing the color saturation it's like it's so it's it's serendipitous you know it's like yeah i, I highly doubt that anybody saw like our art piece yeah. you know and right it's not like someone ripped you off or something no just, no yeah we just had the same inspiration you know so i'm sure that all that long story short um we really like have the ability to like tap into create other people are also tapped into, you know, yeah. and it's not unusual for multiple people to have the same idea at the same time. Um, so, you know, I really think that a lot of people came together, like, you know, all the people I mentioned earlier, Frenchy, Mila, Nika, Phil Salazar, Soul Grand Solventless. Mm -hmm. He was like one of the big guys that like really popularized like hey this is awesome this is how i kind of do it um i mean all those people did so much in their own lives and timelines that people just put stuff together and you know like i'm super fortunate to live in the age of the internet because yeah you know you can literally just reach out to these people and you know i never thought in a million years that like bubble man would be following me and frenchy cannoli and you know all these other like huge hash names um you know, I've last week I won Frenchie Cannoli's hash porn. I was like, going to mention art. that if you didn't. Yeah. Congratulations yeah. on that. Thank you. Yeah. It was my third win um, in a row. And they actually made the sculpture category this year because of like my previous two sculptures that I entered and, and won. And, you know, so they gave me the shout out. He's like, hey, you know, we actually made a new category because of your two previous entries. But, like That's that. Really awesome. It's so humbling and flattering and like I literally never thought in a million years like I'd have this level of interaction with like my idols and role models and it's it's so awesome you know like the hash community is it's really tight knit you know like yeah. there's of course every every company every industry is going to have a little bit of like proprietary requirements and issues and you know but for a large portion of the community like hash and rosin is very open source you know yeah um, and that's what, you know, that's what I try to do, like with my web, with my Instagram page and like my consulting, you know, is obviously like, I'm not going to tell every single person what to do with their exact, like 10 by nine and a half right. foot room or something. But you know, the information that I'm putting on there is stuff that I feel like hasn't really been brought up before. Um, and it's just like, kind of like a, just a broad scientific, scientific concept, you know, um, and I mean, I love sharing. And like I said, you know, like all these people that I've been mentioning, they are super about putting their information online, making yep. YouTube videos and blogs and all this stuff just where, sharing. you know, it's just sharing. And, you know, obviously, like if you can get a corner on the market and uh, nobody else can make the same rosin you're making, yeah, you might make some more money in your city. But, you know, as uh, rosin being not the underdog, it's definitely not the underdog, but basically being like the less known mm -hmm. little brother of live resin, for instance, you know, um, it's really important that we share this information and get the notoriety of rosin up, you know? And, um, you know, so that's, that's why I share as much as I do, um, get the community like engaged and get yeah. people that aren't in the community in the community. Um, you know, so um, I forget where we started with. Well, and I was going to say, last. like, it just to help people understand why rosin has come about, because throughout our discussion, you know, you've <clears throat> sort of been peppering in different things that are starting to tell this narrative of why you would even go into rosin production in the first place, talking about trying to overcome the issue of that uh, waxy layer around the trichome head and trying to, you know, it's like getting really technical with mechanical extraction. Like, how do we withdraw that each oil droplet that is hiding behind, you know, those waxy bits? Um, it, it's, it's, it's really fascinating and a unique kind of snapshot of where our industry is to see. And I'm, I love that you started out at the beginning of the interview talking about uh, Charis and and you know basic dry sift hash and basically just showing how these things have evolved and you know and then bubble hash came around and this idea of well let's separate trichome heads and try to refine you know that way and then this idea of like well 
how do we get past that waxy bit that is always going to be in the trichome heads? Well, maybe we can basically pop them and then, right. and then collect the oils that, that come out and, and go from there. And then, you know, how do we do that the most efficient and clean way? And so it's going to be fascinating to see where it all leads because it feels like solventless is like rosin is one of the last stretches of the solventless marathon um and it's hard to imagine where it can go past you know really refining um that bit of rosin because i'm like what else would you not want in right you know in the extract at that point um, right. so, so it's it's really cool to see that that happening and you know uh, folks like yourself that are really you know have really dived into it and and um you know, are, are kind of bringing that up. I mean, it's one reason I was excited to talk to you because I think I mentioned when we first connected that, it, you know, it kind of dawned on me. I was like, I don't think I've ever done an episode where I've talked just about rosin, you know, awesome. and, and and BC Bubble Man, you know, we talked about bubble hash and we could have talked about rosin, but just with the time, we didn't really have the time to get into that after, you know, spending all the time talking about bubble hash and everything. And uh, so it's kind of funny that it's taken me over 50 episodes to get to the point to talk, <laughs> actually talk about rosin. Um, there's just so much to talk about, you know? Oh yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like it's, yeah, there's a never ending, uh, series of things to talk about. And then also doing the podcast, it's like 50 episodes, but it's like, how many people have I not been able to come back? There's all sorts of people I've talked to that scheduling hasn't quite worked out, you know, so I'm like, there's just so much behind even the people that I've talked to of, of people that I want to talk to that I haven't gotten to, and, and right. things I want to talk about that I haven't gotten to. But uh, I just find all of this really, really fascinating. And I hope that for people listening, it helps to um, kind of make sense of what the hype is about, like why people are excited about it, that it's not just, I think when people hear about rosin, they think, oh, people are excited about that because it's solventless. And it's really right. much more than that, but it, it's really more about the the final quality of the hash itself. And, and right. not just the presence of solvents, but, but, you know, just the chemistry of what's the product that you're left with. Um, right. And uh, I don't know. I find, find all of that super fascinating. I've, my experience with extraction is fairly limited. I've, I've had experience of doing like CO2 and ethanol extractions at scale. Right. I've been around a lot of distillation and stuff, but never really played around with, um, rosin production before, um, uh, plenty of friends that have, you know, and have been around right. and seen it, but haven't gotten my hands on it uh, much. But after this conversation, I'm kind of like, uh, I'd like to do some small scale just to like, think about some of these things that you've brought up, um, you know, Absolutely. pay more attention to uh, the trichome morphology and think about, you know, what's that uh, uh, going to produce. And I, I guess my next question for you kind of leads into um, what are... Well, there's actually several things popping in my mind. I mean, one thing mm -hmm. you kind of already talked about the difference between the live resin cured resin bit. That was definitely something I wanted to bring up. Like why do some people prefer one over the other? And there's, there's some companies out there that are very, very passionate about um, arguing over uh, that issue. Um, the live resin versus right. uh, the cured resin. Um, but also um, what, I'm trying to think of the way to, to to phrase where I want to go with this. I guess I'll start with why do some people choose to um, harvest the trichomes and make rosin that way? And why do some people still press flowers? Right. So, um, and you know, I, I think the one thing that I, I'll just finish up the description of rosin and then, and then answer yeah, that yeah. is basically, you know, once you've isolated those heads um, and this kind of answers that question, quite a bit is that hash is still wet once you have separated it and you know you're either separate it like i said based on bag size and keeping those microns separate for either dabbing or for adding making to a different product or um you don't even have to use all eight bags yeah. you can just pick your selection of what you want maybe let's say 43 up to 120 and then collect everything that's 44 all the way up to you know 120 and that can be your full spec rosin. Yeah. Um, but once you have collected it, or depending on whether or not you are separating it based on micron or just collecting one single uh, mass of hash, um, homogenized into you know 
all, all the grades together. Um, it still has to be dried. So if you're using water, you know, dry sift does not use water. It's dry, right? Um, you using dried plant matter. So oftentimes it can be stuff that is a little bit older. You know, it's not like, mm. oh, we're making this for rosin right now. It's like, oh, hey, we got a couple pounds of this. It's already dried. It's being it's stored properly. It's good weed, you know, like let's use it. You know, it doesn't take as much storage. It doesn't take as much um, space, obviously, yeah. when it's dried um, for either, you know, the curing, drying racks and then the space mm -hmm. for just storing the biomass. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because the, the, the bud does shrink significantly. Um, and when you are making this ice water hash, you have to dry it. So there's there's two methods, really. Um, there's air drying, which either uh, you use like a sieve, um, you know, basically like a flour sift. Mm -hmm. And you will either allow that wet hash to pass through that. And again, it's got to be cold. Otherwise, it's going to stick to that that screen. But when you are, you can sieve through it basically, and it will allow those heads to, you know, you dry it on top of a parchment paper. And basically, um, most of the water will come out. You know, you're not trying to squish the water out of the bag or anything like that. Again, gentle with the heads. And, um, you know, basically, you can take that, dry it out over a larger surface area, and then it will air dry. You, know, you can just agitate it a little bit. Usually, air drying takes depending on your environment um florida takes like almost seven days usually yeah, um without right. like having a dehumidifier in the room and you know like it's uh it takes a little bit longer in florida but you know it can take two to seven days basically depending on your environment and how much hash you have and how well it's spread apart um problem with that is that it takes a lot more time to either sieve it by hand mm -hmm. um and then obviously seven days of drying is a lot of time um or there's another method where you can actually take the uh, that hash that has been collected, you can put it on top of like a, another small, it's called like a, a blotting cloth mm -hmm. or a blotting uh, filter. It's basically 25 micron. You put the hash on top, put like a towel or something underneath, and the gravity will wick the water out. Um, you can freeze that into like a little puck. And I have a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, like descriptions of stuff that um, like different concepts of rosin on my IG, if anybody wants to check that out, to, you know, read some more like, in detail text that they want to refer back to. Uh, again, it's Botanic Chemist I, uh, on IG. Um, but basically when um, you can, you can either see that with like a microplane, you know, like a, a zester, you know what I'm saying? Um, the problem with this is that while it, is good for like increasing the surface area and getting that hash spread out. Um, those blades can absolutely damage those trichome heads, yeah. which, you know, if you pop it open, the resin is drying on the sheet, you are going to lose a little bit of that yep. uh, oil, you know, to <clears throat> evaporation, but still wax is going to stay behind. Um, so, but that uses a minimal of equipment. You know, you literally just yeah. need some body paper, some towels, and then either like a microplane or a sieve. Um, but, and you need space. So depending on how much you do, you know, if you're doing a large batch, some pe people will dry it like in a cardboard pizza box, put a parchment down. Mm -hmm. People used to put it directly on cardboard because they're like, oh, it's absorbing, you know, but cardboard has a lot of dust. So yeah. like, I don't, yeah. I really don't recommend cardboard or a uh, towel, like paper towels. They have so much lint in yep. them. Like, yep. you know, you're literally, don't even use it in the lab. Get like a lint free, low lint towel. If you're going to wipe your tables that your, your work surfaces your press, anything like that. So basically um, it has to be dried before it can be pressed. So air drying is very simple uh, or, you know, a minimal investment to get mm -hmm. started. And then there is freeze drying, you know, lyophilization. Yeah. And, you know, um, there are, you know, lab grade, like flask um, lyo units mm -hmm. um their shelf units and that's what you want for hash because you really want that surface area so uh for people that don't know what freeze drying is it's if anybody's ever seen a vac oven it's sort of similar in the way that it's a sealed vessel with a heat source inside with vacuum applied mm -hmm. but with lyophilization the point is to apply such a deep vacuum and actually the the is frozen you know, it's actually it's yep. 
it's a it's a freezer basically the tube is wrapped in like condenser coil and that chamber gets down to like negative 20 i think that's like about the one of the some of the lowest it can go i think um and people have made uh, always forget harvest right um they make freeze dryer units for like home use for, you know, people trying to make, you know, I mean, you can do any, you can dry anything with it. Like during the pandemic, they sold out everywhere because people were trying to, you yeah. know, prep basically yep. dry their food. Great idea. I mean, people should be doing that, you know, like we have way too much food waste. So, yeah. yep. um, you know, so um, basically though, the, the chamber will reach such a deep vacuum and get to such a low temperature that the, um, the phase change, the triple point of where water will either ice will melt into water or water can turn into gas at a low enough pressure, high enough temperature. But when you are doing, um, or high pressure, high temperature, but when you are doing a low pressure, low temperature and you get that water down to its, it's called the sublimation point mm -hmm. where as soon as you apply the correct amount of heat that ice directly transitions from a solid state to its gas state. Um, and when you are using a uh, vacuum, obviously, um, it's able to pull that moisture out yeah. of the hash. And, you know, basically the moisture, it's, it stays inside uh, the freeze dryer unit. It gets frozen to the walls, the chamber, basically. Um, but there is still there. There are terpenes that can be collected from it. And um, my buddy Pressington's um, on IG, um, he has been working on uh, developing, like putting like a cold trap, cold finger basically oh, in between yeah, yeah. the pump and the unit. And they're they're starting to see some pretty impressive, uh, some pretty impressive things. Actually, I'm gonna make a post about it because he sent me some pretty detailed information. I want to make a post and give him a shout out. Uh, I just I've been moving, so I've had time yep. to be on the internet. Really. <laughs> I know how it is. Yeah. Um, man but you know so basically as opposed to needing a very large amount of heat or vacuum like you would be using for again the hydrocarbon extracts to get those solvents out um it, it's really treating it treating it pretty ginger um pretty gingerly pretty gently and um that freeze drying process can take you know one to two days depending on the amount of hash in the machine the more water the longer it will take the higher your ambient temperature right, right. of the room, the longer it's going to take. Um, and basically, um, they're, and they're a little cost prohibitive, you know what I'm saying? So a few thousand dollars, I think they're like four to six, depending on the size. There's like small, medium, large. And Harvest Right, they've made the home. They've made the uh, Scientific, which is uh, has like ramp up settings. Like you can literally change the length of time it takes to ramp up to your shelf temp, oh, how long yeah, it holds yeah. it that for. Mm -hmm. It has a, a lot of settings, but I mean, you really have to understand sublimation and like the physics of that, you know? So it's definitely, um, I, I don't recommend uh, the scientific to people. And again, that's a little more expensive, but they actually manufactured one called the um, pharmaceutical, which it sounds like that would be the top mm -hmm. grade, but um, it's not. That was actually developed with hash in mind. Um, so it has like, uh, you can adjust the times and the temps and, um, you can get a little bit more, um, customization with that unit. And, but you know, so it's a, it's a little cost prohibitive four to $6,000. Again, if you're making a hundred plus grams of rosin a day though, mm -hmm. it's yeah. paid back within afternoon. Um, so, you know, you need dedicated power setup. You need like a dedicated, um, outlet, you know, I think it's like 45 amps, um, and, or maybe 25, 35, something like that. Um, but you know, like you, you do need a dedicated space for it. Um, and, but the problem, the, not the problem, the great thing with that compared to air drying is that, um, it's not damaging those heads right. when you're sifting or, uh, sieving or microplaning it. It is taking a sig significant less amount of time to be able to press it into rosin. Yeah. Um, and, and it's and it's consistent exactly and it's consistent you can replicate the same exact dryness same exact level every single time with the proper notes you know um so at that point it can it's dry so that's this is where we make rosin um once that hash is finally dry you never want to press 
wet hash you never want to press like you can make flour rosin too where you know you squish the bud mm -hmm. the oil comes out that's definitely lower quality than hash rosin because all the water soluble mm -hmm. compounds chlorophyll all that stuff you know um and but you never ever want to press a live bud only dried bud you know you don't want water in your press basically <laughs> you don't want any water yeah. in your press any any more than like the very low percentage that would be in the in the cuticle or anything you know um and then basically i actually have my I have my rosin press right here oh cool um so basically oh, nice. yeah. i'll get a little bit closer um the concept is that let me grab my bags too you can use um they're called rosin bags, which again, they're nylon micron filters, uh, which are the same material as um, washing bags. And um, the idea is that they are shaped the same size as the plate roughly. Yep. And um, they have a seam on one side, on the bottom and on one side and an open end on this side. So this is a low temp plates. Um, these guys sent this to me uh, basically after I went and took their class, uh, with Ken wall out in Oklahoma and, nice. uh, we're, we're talking about working more and more together and I, I'll, I'll be able to talk about that publicly very soon. Um, but basically the idea is that once you have that dried hash, however you'd like to do it, um, you would put a filter in it. Um, people nice. use spoons. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. This is actually 3d printed. They're 3d printing these at low temp. That's cool. Uh, right. Isn't that cool? So <laughs> Basically, the idea is that you would fill this bag all the way with hash, and you see this one is – you can't see through it. It's This is a 15 micron. Yeah. So typically, I like using either 25 or 37 micron for pressing just because it gets a slightly higher yield. And if you're doing – if you're already pressing really high-quality hash, um, you're not really – you don't need the smaller micron to leave behind plant matter, stocks like that. Right, you know. Right. So if, you, if you're if you being gentle with it and you're getting uh, a good – quality hash with it um you really only need like a 37 but again this can be used for even even further things of like you said leaving behind more of that wax um and you know plant matter stuff like that and using it for like making uh mechanically isolated thca stuff like that yeah. you know um so the idea is that when this is filled with hash and these uh you want the corners to be all the way full you know and you cold room shake it down like that to get everything nice and flat nice and even because if you have one high spot yeah word out you know um so the idea is you'd fill it and most people i like to i usually like i said i use the the larger 37 you'll fill it you give it a slight fold and then you will take a second bag and you know you can do like a 37 on the inside and a 25 on the outside or a 15 on the outside or uh you know lots of experimentation that can be done yeah and Basically, you would fold that, put the folded end into the bag while keeping the seams opposite of each other. Gotcha. So yeah. it basically yeah. adds some structural integrity to it. Um, at that point, um, I should have right here. And Low Temp just started making their own bags as well. Rosin Evolution. Uh, I love that guy. He's super cool to me. Um, there's, I mean, so the hash community is super tight, you know, like yeah. very, very tight knit. And so, but low temp just started making some as well. Um, uh, they work together pretty extensively, you know, so, and everybody needs all this stuff. So, you know, it's not, there's so little manufacturers about of this equipment and stuff. It's like, there's not really much competition, right? You know? Yeah. Like, we're all in it together. Like that's nice the, that it's still in that collaborative um uh, stage absolutely you know so basically this is like 25 micron bag and these are 220 u micron bags okay. same size as this yeah. so ken wall the um the guy i actually like learned my live rosin technique from um he does like 100 gram hash presses he'll put it in like a 25 or a 37 or something and then he will put one of these welded uh 220 micron bags basically you know they're not they're not mm. sewed together they're basically mm -hmm. like heat crimped you know um and this adds so much structural integrity to that bag that he can really like overfill those wow. overfill his bags and then just it doesn't bust and it just 
dumps. Like it literally pours. Wow. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So basically once you have it in your desired bags, you would use a piece of parchment paper. These are pre-cut parchment. Um, and the idea is that you're using parchment because, you know, you don't want to put your hash right inside your press or you're going to get oil all over your equipment. Um, so basically, you would take a piece of parchment. And so these are like usually this is pre-cut for um, low time. You can, you know, you can literally buy um, uh, non-bleached is mm -hmm. you know kind of ideal um and it just really depends what you can get and there's like i said there's a lot of people making stuff um like low temp made this got this manufactured for them um there's another black label paper um they make like really high quality thick paper for rosin and you know bacon all sorts of stuff yeah um the thicker it is it, it can be reused as well um but only for the same strain and right. only if you're not using too high a pressure and you don't see like damage to the paper. So depending on the bag. So what I like to do always is you can do either directional flow or just like regular pressing. And the idea is I like to pretty much always, regardless of if I'm doing directional or not, I fold these edges inwards. Um, one, so it fits in between the plates and two, um, if oil comes out this way, yeah. it's, it's going to have a much harder time getting yeah. out. Yeah. So, you know, basically the idea is you can do directional flow, which I kind of have this at the right size. Well, pretend this had hash in it mm -hmm. and, you know, we put it under there. We make sure everything stays folded. We make sure, you know, the bag isn't like cockeyed, you know, or yeah. uh, folded up, messed up inside. And then the idea is that, and this, this would be like almost directional flow. Not quite. I didn't like fold it super tight around it. But the idea is that by folding the bag right slightly larger than uh, folding the parchment slightly larger than the bag inside will allow most of that rosin to force itself front yeah. ways as opposed to staying on the plate. Right. It has um, nowhere else to go. It has nowhere else to go. Exactly. Yeah. So once you have your hash already, everything's bagged up, everything is nice and cool. Again, you don't want to get too hot uh, before you start pressing it, which is it's less of a concern once it's in the bag. You know, mm -hmm. it's in the bag, you can get a little bit warm. A lot of people do like pre greasing where they'll like either hold it mm -hmm. or they'll put it on top of their press or they'll do uh, like a slight pre press. Soften it up. Yeah. 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 And you know, if you're doing a lot of hash in the press, that, that makes sense to me because. It, you are, you know, weakening those those cuticles mm -hmm. so you can more easily apply less pressure, less time. Right. Um, but for the most part, if if you're if you're really doing it like work, like I said, working with good quality hash, you really don't need to do like pre pressing, do a pre warm up. Um, so the idea is basically that these are two heated plates. Um, like this is my custom logo, um, low temp, like they. They print everything or they, they custom cut or laser engrave nice, everything. Nice. And uh, these are actually feet that they can mount on the side. And you can oh, turn okay. it uh, horizontal, basically, vertical drip. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. I like doing it like, like this just because you can set it down and then just start pumping as opposed to, like, having to hold it while you're pumping. And yeah. I just prefer it like this. But, you know, it's there are options. Um, and the idea is that these plates aluminum plates they have heating rods inside there's a temperature controller um which can actually uh change the temperature of nice yeah the, like the individual plates um they actually put a magnet on it so it's not this part isn't magnetic but um basically you know it's this actually can also be used as a, a dabbing e-rig controller so, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 super cool. It's a universal so, temperature controller. Yeah, exactly. So you know, you will you will have your uh, temperature put in. Um, you can you can go as literally as low as like a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, the max you really ever 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 want to do is like two hundred. But okay. I don't. That was, that was I the question I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah, that's about the highest you mm -hmm. want to go. Um, 
And typically, though, you know, a lot of people will do first press and second press, mm -hmm. and they'll do their first press, lower temp, less amount of time, less amount of pressure. And, um, you know, they will collect that, um, sell that as their first press, and then you can take the bag and then repress it. So the idea is that once these plates are heated up, um, like 160 to 180 is like getting you it's it's one of the most uh, efficient ranges um for hash pressing because it allows you to get most of the yield out without using too much heat and degrading those terps mm -hmm. and you know, or causing it to like butter up and nucleate on the plate um so when you're using the the right temperature so like the lower the temperature typically typically like the chalkier it will come out you know like the okay. higher amount of like cannabinoids and um you are you're leaving behind a lot of you are leaving behind a decent amount of stuff um but basically you are not like melting everything together so you can get like really low temps and again it, it is strain dependent so you know like there is some stuff where you know i've seen pressed at like 100 degrees fahrenheit and it's this like translucent mm -hmm. yellow light like clear rosin um and then i've also seen like lower temps where it's pressed and you get like almost like a, a buttery thca nucleation yeah. type product um if you're using like right about 160 180 you're typically getting a more homogenized oil that's coming out uh, it's usually looking like the same color um same viscosity and you know the idea is once you have this heated up you get these plates. I don't have my uh, pump hooked up right now. Um, this is like a little pressure, uh, a little pressure system. It's a bottle jack, and these things can be bought with either you can buy just the plates and put it into your own pressure source. You can buy um, just the plates in the cage, and uh, basically you can buy just the plates and install in your own cage unit, like either a um, a um, sorry, I almost tried to kick me out of the room. <laughs> um, basically uh like a harbor freight bearing press or something like oh, that gotcha. you, can, you okay. can use something like that or uh you can get a larger cage kit which comes with like a bottle jack that you can use to jack up your car stuff like that so the idea is that once these plates are hot and you have this hash in between here you apply the pressure to it slowly very very slowly because again you don't want to apply too much pressure something blows out right. especially if one side is higher than the other you know thicker than the other so going and that's another reason people do the pre-presses you know if they don't have it fully nice mm, and even you can yeah. go very low and slow and it'll kind of even it all out. out yeah exactly exactly so um and you know like you want it to be you want the bag to be in between the edges of the plate you don't want it to be sticking over the side hanging out over the back that's how you get a blowout as well um and basically like i said um 160 to 180 Two minutes max really is okay. what what i would recommend for those temperatures um the lower the temperature the longer you can go mm -hmm. um but you know again the longer it's on the plate exposed to heat yeah it's going to be evaporating those terpenes and it's going to be converting those cannabinoids you know even if it's to the slightest yeah. degree it's still happening um and you know so basically you want to maximize yield while minimizing time on the hot plates so oh, minute minute 30 um you know what i like to recommend to people is again taking notes experiment you know start at a lower range and calculating your yields and these bags when you're filling these bags a lot of people might be tempted to just like have a big bowl of hash in front of them fill them up set it it looks full fill it up set it over but then you know they're just they're weighing the rosin at the end but they're not like tearing the bag they seeing don't how much really know what the yield is that. right yeah you you know and a lot of people do but a lot of people don't yeah. um so you know just one really huge tip that i recommend is like always fill these bags with the same amount of hash mm -hmm. you know if you have let's say 45 grams of hash and i like to use a little bit of less hash too like i don't i don't fill these up to 100 grams and go for like those huge presses mm -hmm. um i like doing smaller amounts for low amounts of time so you know, I would fill this with something like 15 grams, roughly, of hash. And let's say I had 45 grams, right? And 
my, I would do three bags of 15. Let's say I only had, or let's say I had, uh, like, I don't know, 80 or something, you know, you could either do four bags of 20 mm, or you I could see, do, yeah. you know, like you, you want to keep them the same amount. You don't want to be like, oh, 15, 15, 15, 20, yeah. because minimizing that variable, um, you know, you, you, you might even think that like, oh, putting more hash in it is going to get me a bigger yield. But if more hash is in there and it takes longer for it to come out of the plates, it might be, yeah volatizing it and you know decreasing your quality of your overall yield right. so um by uh by taking this basically and um only leaving it on the plate for that certain amount of time um you can or i'm sorry by by putting a certain amount of hash in these bags each time you're minimizing your va variables and able to see like okay, 15 is getting 15 grams in these bags is getting me an 80% yield. That's awesome. Okay, I put 25 grams in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I'm only getting a 75% yield. And um, basically, so yeah, that's, that's the idea behind the, the rosin pressing. But basically, um, there is an I had a conversation, I don't want to say argument, but you know, debate. Sure. Um, Healthy with people argument. about yeah healthy argument about um the um the term like diminishing returns yeah and yeah. you know the idea is that just because you are getting you know let's say you do seven washes instead of five washes or five washes instead of three washes and instead of running a cycle at you know basically a lot of people like to do like the first first wash either by hand or machine like mm -hmm. three minutes five minutes or so small amount of agitation they take that that's called like first pull first wash yeah um and you know that typically does have more trichome heads than contaminants just because it was so easy to break them off so right. little time going into it that stuff is really nice usually so after each wash and you know you could you can make washes long and do less of them, or you can do shorter ones and separate it, especially if you're separating your yeah. hash by micron grade. Um, and basically though, that diminishing return um, is 100% a thing because just because you think that, you know, you took 20 minutes on each wash, you wash for an hour or something, three, three cycles, your yield, let's say is a hundred grams, compared to let's say 75 grams of washing it for like two hours you know yeah. and each wash each additional wash gets a little bit less and less hash and you basically there's no like one size fits all like do five washes for five sure. minutes each yeah. um it's very much a visual process it's very much being able to be like okay this is um obviously a lot of stock and plant matter in this i'm gonna stop you know yeah, yeah. um and so the idea is that by um, overwashing it, you can actually get way too much plant matter and contaminants, stock. I mean, you can smoke it, so it's not dirt contaminant, but it's right, non-desirable. Right. Um, and, you know, basically, even though you might only get 75 grams of hash versus the 100 mm -hmm. that you thought you were getting, you can end up pressing that same homogenized collected hash and get a 90% yield on your 75 grams, but only get a 70% yield on your 100 grams, yeah. you know? So, and of course, and that's not like exact math, you know, that's just an right. example of, you can decrease your yield of hash while increasing your rosin yield. And you can, the inverse is true, you can increase your hash yield, but decrease your rosin yield. Um, so that is, that's super important. Um, and what I really recommend to people is, buying a lab scope, lab microscope, yep. some slides, even just like a, a, a loop if you can. And as you're going through your washes, physically check those. And yeah. It kind of, usually you have to wait until it's dry. Um, but you can still see, like I said, like you can get to the, where you think your final washes, look at it very closely and be like, whoa, this is still like 70% heads. I'm going to yeah, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. You know, you know, so, um, 
And you could define it, all uh, of that, like in a in a scaled, you know, really professional environment. Those are all quality standards that you can totally define and train yes. people on, um, to to keep things efficient and so that you're not, you know, playing, you know, guessing games. Because you know, like you were saying, it's not some of this stuff can't just be dialed in that we're gonna we're going to do things at the same number of washes and the same type of pressing parameters and everything. Um, it really, it really does vary. Um, uh, not just cultivar to cultivar, but even plant to plant <laughs> depending yeah. on, yeah. you know, the grow environment 100%. and stuff. And so, you know, being trained, not just to, you know, what are the parameters we need to use, but what are the qualities that we are actually looking at and making decisions on um, is so critical. And going back to kind of some of your comments at the early part of, you know, that some companies just have consultants come in that say, okay, here's your, your method. You're going to run these parameters and you'll be making rosin go. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's an example of one of the things that's often missed is how do you respond to the interbatch variability uh, that you're inevitably going to see. And if you're not trained to understand quality and to understand all of these little nuances of what you're looking at with these trichomes and how to assess the quality of your pulls, um, you're going to be leaving, you know, going back to, you're going to be leaving money on the table potentially, yeah. or or you're spending money that you don't need to be spending in the right. in the case of resources, time and energy and, and other things. Um so uh, that's it's I'm glad that you've you've brought all this up because it's important things that I think often get uh, especially folks that are kind of thinking about adopting rosin as a product, you know, into their kind of assortment of of listings. Um, these kinds of things may not be appreciated so much, um, at least not not uh, initially until they run into these issues themselves and recognize right. why you can't and one size fits all just doesn't work. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, like, uh, there are best practices, 100%. There are, um, you know, like, in, in my consultation, I make custom SOPs for people too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I usually do is, we'll start off with an introduction call. And, you know, I will uh, basically get their background on what they understand at this point, what kind of equipment they have, what they're going for. Um, and then, you know, based on what they're aiming for, um, I have enough experience with it that I, I can recommend those best practices for the scale of the lab. But like exactly like you said, it to to get really, really good, you know, I mean, not saying that uh, people that don't have like a very, very deep scientific understanding can't make good rosin or hash. Um, but to be able to like innovate and like really find these like niches of like, oh, wow, you know, I figured out how to increase the yield by this much just by like changing the bag size. Like you really do have to like have that deep understanding, at least like yeah. um, being trained what to look for, you know, like mm -hmm. being trained in quality, being working in a lab. And, you know, I mentioned it earlier, um, beer brewing was like my professional, my first science job, like you said earlier. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that I would hire a beer brewer or a cellarman in a heartbeat like mm. i'm not hiring right now but um like you know for anybody out there that is looking to hire people or if you are a beer brewer like you that skill set the the skill set that beer brewers already have with the understanding the difference between cleanliness and sanitation yeah. and understanding yeah. how to move uh large volumes of liquid cleanly safely yeah. um inefficiently like, I mean, I literally, I would hire, I'd hire a beer brewer or like somebody that works like in a production kitchen, like in a heartbeat. Um, yeah. They just already have, they already have the mindset. They already have the quality. Don't touch the floor, you know, like uh, <laughs> don't touch anything <laughs> unless you have new clean gloves on. And then if you touch something dirty, change your gloves. Yes. Um, yes. That's one of the hardest things that, is to get people to actually change <sighs> their gloves. <laughs> dude it's crazy man like i've seen people like pick something up off the ground they had gloves on they use a paper towel pick something off the ground wipe it off the ground i'm like you got to change your gloves now and they're like but i just use a paper towel like, doesn't matter it's yeah, gonna it's, it gets through it 
<laughs> yeah. Yes. We talk yes. about right. talk about filters, <laughs> paper towels. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. Pretty, pretty big gaps. Yeah, it's not like it's an N95 paper towel or something, you know, like, um, you know, so yeah, you know, there's definitely like there's best practices and stuff that like mistakes that you can easily make that if you already know how to not make them, you're already like leaps and bounds yeah. ahead of. And then you can just out there. focus on the product and and all of those qualities without having to also stack in basic GMP stuff, because that's that's really yeah. what you're describing. It's just basic food safety GMP, yep. you know, uh, sort of things that all producers should be implementing. And it's something I've really been harping on a lot lately because, uh, once again, because of the hemp industry and all the craziness around that. Right. Um, you know, I'm like, if you're not already integrating good manufacturing practices, and, I, and when I say that, I mean something very specific, which is if you are not reading the federal uh, – you know, regulatory codes that explain what good manufacturing practices are. And if you're not ensuring that your company is implementing them, um, you're going to run into trouble sooner or later. I mean, one, just the regulatory yeah. side, but also it's a market dif differentiation thing too. It's about ensuring that you can actually stand behind any claims that you're making about quality, you know, that's right. like, well, no, like we have these processes in place to ensure that things are clean. We don't just say that we do things you know, in a clean way, um, we right. we have all of these things in mind, and it is in line with what the FDA would you know expect from any product that's being manufactured that someone's going to consume in some way. Um, right. And uh, yeah, so I'm I'm really glad you brought that up. That's one of the things that uh, not so much over the past year. Once COVID hit, my consulting got changed quite a bit, but that was something I did quite a bit of consulting on um, over the past several years with hemp companies, this GMP and uh, helping them try to understand how important that is and, and how it's going to benefit them in the long run. Because uh, a lot Absolutely. of times producers see it as like a hurdle, you know, it's like, uh, here's another compliance thing I have to do. And I'm like, don't think about it as compliance. Think of it as quality. Right. Um, right. It literally, it literally is ensuring and again, you know, it goes back to basically like, you know, having like chain of command, yeah, yeah, like yeah. best practices of like, yep. okay, employee has come in and cleaned and sanitized the workspace. Yep. You know that there's not going to be any dirt, dust, plant matter that was, might've been handled on that table getting into your rosin, which, you know, if you got a big green chunk and a nice white, like very light colored gram of rosin, somebody's gonna be like, what is this shit? You know, right. it's like, that's weed. <laughs> It's weed, but it's not desirable. People will bring it back. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's depending on where you're at, 50 to 100 bucks or more left on the left on the table. And literally, especially if you like put it on the table and got weed on plus, it. And, plus the brand um, uh, reputation, too. Right. Yeah, it's a big thing. And, you know, like the the custy um, like phenomenon, like it's it's very much true. Like people are very there are customers that you know custody is kind of a derogatory term uh you know used by <laughs> industry professionals but um you know it's uh it's like a, it's a customer mindset of the of what they see online and what they see other mm -hmm. people talking about and stuff often very more often than not like if i found a gram of rosin and i saw a little speck in it i'd pull it out and look at it and be like oh that's just me yeah like, oh that's red paint chip or something you, know, you can tell the difference you know yeah. um but you know when you are um when you're actually like doing those like having those that chain of command keep the thing clean no outside clothing you know if you yeah. you come in you change if you leave the building you aren't wearing the same shoes and clothing that you just walked out to the dirt parking lot in um you know like all the way up to um no pockets like if you don't have shirt pockets there's no chance for anybody's stuff to fall into a product you know right, right. like yeah there's just so many things and you know like I, I like taking photos of rosin and stuff but like you know i love i love taking photos in the lab but at the same time you really need to have that like clean hand mentality like right right if you, if you are going to be taking photos in the lab i just recommend like pull your phone out you take your gloves off first yep yeah, like, yeah you yeah, never yeah. risk because everybody does it, takes their phone to the bathroom, yep. sleeps right yep. next to it, 
sets it on random surfaces. Like we, I was having this conversation with my fiance and my mom last time we were hanging out and we went to the beach and we we're just talking about how gross people's phones are. Yep. And my mom and uh, my fiance were in the ladies bathroom. They sent me a photo of like, just like the side of a stall, somebody sitting with their floor, their phone on the ground in between their feet in front of the toilet. Oh my God. Disgusting. Disgusting, dude. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm OCD, but I'm definitely like, you know, working in microbiology. Like, right. There's some practical I'm not a, things. I'm not a germaphobe. I'm a germaphile, but like, I'm still like very cautious, you know, yes, like. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's how I feel too. If you spend any amount of time working in labs, yeah, especially doing microbiology, analytical stuff, uh, it changes the way you think about things. And I, uh, it, it's, it, it can be a fine line sometimes because, uh, you just you just think about things uh, a lot more than the average person does. But you're absolutely right. Phones are a major uh, source of contamination in labs, and like something that I've it's something I've run into when, for instance, workers want to have like music playing in the lab, and they want their right. that's that's the biggest excuse that I've gotten from people why they need their phone on them right. in the production facility. And obviously, there's all sorts of creative ways you can do to deal with that but um you know that's uh, the huge one taking off gloves even training people like okay treat your phone like everything else wipe it down before yeah. anything gets going you know and, and I do not it to my every single day at the house yep yeah just, just paper towel iso just wipe it go ahead and wipe it down and you know sterilize it as best as you can um some phones if particularly if you actually have buttons on your phone uh, some yes. of them you can even actually put in a bag or something to like keep it sort of isolated away, and then right. it's then it's really easy to just um, uh, you know keep track of of what's going on. Um, but uh, that's a big one. I'm glad you brought up because it's something a lot of people probably don't think about. Um, right now, I I've totally lost track of time. I see here we've gone for <laughs> over two hours here. Um, nice. So to s sort of start to wrap things up and to tie into um, your hash porn win, I would be remiss if I did not talk about the fact that um, you and I both have gotten into the world of NFTs, uh, yeah. of uh, cannabis-associated NFTs. And for those that, that don't know, um, John put out a an NFT, I guess it's a little while back now. It's been a few weeks or a month or so. Yeah, I think um, it's like a month and a half or so. Yeah, um, but it's probably the first cannabis extract nft at least that we could find i mean because i've right. i've looked around as well um there's been a couple that have popped up since then because you and i minted ours around the same time and mm -hmm. um i remember doing research to try to see because uh, when i was doing it i was like has anyone done this for like the educational side yet has anyone put out like educational right. cannabis nfts or or anything and um i had only seen just a a couple others and most of them were either macro photography nfts or they were about strains you know like art that represented right. a strain um so right um that was pretty cool I, and that's really one of the ways that you and i like majorly like connected because when i saw you did that i was like dude <laughs> like we were thinking <laughs> a, along the, the same lines there uh, yeah uh, but i was i was really stoked to see that so what are your thoughts on um nfts in the cannabis space and kind of where's your mind at with it how are you approaching that right yeah so um you know nfts it's it's obviously it's been a really big buzzword lately um you know one of the biggest names that did it is like nba top shot you know yeah. so for anybody that doesn't know an nft it's a non-fungible token so it is basically a cryptographically secured it could be anything ranging from like a photo you know a word document a song um like a video like in the case of nba top shot they take like highlights of yep. uh, basketball games and you know basically anybody uh, the difference between a non-fungible token and something fungible is like a dollar bill is a fungible token if you will a uh, dollar bill uh there are millions of them. They do the same exact thing. They can be used to buy something for a dollar today. They can be used something to buy something different for a dollar tomorrow. Um, NFTs are different in that they are individual 
objects that are basically um, validated or, you know, uh, there are like like the Mona Lisa or, you know, like a P- Pablo Picasso piece, um, like a certificate of authenticity. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. You know, so it basically is even though anybody can really go online and look at these NFTs, you know, like people can go look at my hash hash mm-hmm. art NFT. You know, it's a 350 gram of rosin that I made into a, a pizza slice, pepperoni mushroom pizza slice. And, you know, a lot of people's, uh, you know, issue with it and, and, and uh, confusion about it is like, well, why would I buy this if I can just access it online? And what gets really cool with NFTs, uh, what I'm really excited about is the fact that, yes, you know, uh, you can sell a piece of artwork. Like, you know, uh, Beeple uh, Crap, mm-hmm. Beeple Crap is his IG. Um, he was like the first person that I saw do an NFT. And I would like, I love his art. You know, he just has some really trippy, like just out there social commentary art, mm-hmm. you know, like it's, it's good stuff. Um, and, you're like, are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Right. Like, oh, you're right. right in the middle, dude. You don't <laughs> give a shit. That's, that's where you're at. Um, I'm with them there, though. Um, yeah. yep. And, you know, basically, the idea is that even though somebody can go access and look at this document, it isn't theirs. And um, once you make a bid on an NFT, um, w- w- regardless of what it is, whether it's a video or a photo or whatever, that NFT, that, that document becomes yours to trade like a token or like a, like a trading card. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's why NBA top shot had a lot of success. Um, people love collecting sports memorabilia and cards yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, more often than not, these tokens are, uh, not something that's already like, you know, like a game that ever has been posted online or, you know, recorded 10 years ago and it's forever. It's, it's typically like these special videos, special photos, special moments yeah. captured um, that are you, like, they're, they're more rare just because they're not necessarily all over the internet. But what's really cool about these NFTs and, you know, when you, when you describe it as a trading card, that's digital. People are still like, eh, you know, it still doesn't really make too much sense. But when it comes to the point of like the hidden features and the yes. other things that you can yeah. do with these NFTs, yep. that is that is where that's the we're secret see sauce. A lot of magic. That's yep. the secret sauce right there. And you know, a lot of people are you know like responded to my thing like I'm just going to buy a pizza a uh, picture of a pizza slice. And it's like no, actually, if you do go on the site, I minted mine on OpenSea. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just like, I don't know. It was the one that one of my buddies was using and it suggested, he's like, Hey, maybe check this out. And, you know, so I, I just did it through there. And basically um, like, if you do go look at, at the details of my NFT, you can see that they actually come with um, like discounts on like my consultation services, um, discounts from equipment manufacturers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, basically it's like a unlockable, uh, like a secret, either like an Easter egg, mm-hmm. or you know, it can be it can be anything from like a website address to a discount coupon code to a um, an extra file on top of it. Right. You know, um, something that okay, yes, this is an entity that everybody can see, but only the people that bid on this are going to be able to have access. It's like a ticket, and not even bid. Right, it's like a ticket. You know, exactly. It's like Willy Wonka's golden ticket. You mm-hmm. know, and but yes, you can you can basically eat the candy bar, but you can't like keep the ticket. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you just look at it online. So when you when you actually bid and uh, you know I I think you know one of the one of the things that I kind of think is like right now kind of a bottleneck with it uh, roadblock is that um, a lot of them have like reserves. You know, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. one. Ether reserve, which is like over two thousand bucks right now, and the volatility, yeah, the volatility of crypto has made that really challenging. Right, and you know, so, but um, and but an NFT can be more. It can. It doesn't just have to be one file that one person owns. Yeah. 
multiple people, you know, you can make 40 copies of this thing and then 40 people, um, could have a piece of the pie, you know, basically I, I think I saw something that, um, it was either like Elvis Presley's guitar or somebody, some famous musician's guitar that an auction house was listing like fractions of an NFT basically for you mm -hmm. to own, have part ownership of this Elvis Presley's guitar. Yeah. Obviously not one person. And if it's not, it's not the NFT, you know, it's like they can actually apply this to, okay, do all 40 want to vote in on a pool? We're going right. to sell this. Right. And to, everyone benefits. Elon Musk or whatever, and yeah. you know he bought it for ten billion dollars, and now we all get to split it forty ways. Yeah, um, you know, so there's really there's so many applications, and um, you know, even uh, like there's there's virtual real estate now. Yeah. There yeah. is, um, you know, and I think a, a really good way to look think about an NFT, especially like if people play video games, is like you know like World of Warcraft kind of made some of like the first NFTs yeah, yeah. basically of like oh, guess what? I mean, it wasn't cryptographically secured necessarily. I, you know, obviously it had like a programming algorithm that you couldn't hack, you know, necessarily. So, but at the same time, people were like selling their mounts and uh, mm -hmm. armor and equipment and items and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, people do it. Uh, what was that? What was that really create? Like Fruit Ninja or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, There's one that was like everywhere. Farmville. Farmville. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the one. I never played it because I was like, well, first of all, that's just not my type of game. But, uh, you know, it's like people were spending a hundred bucks. Yeah. Pokemon of the, Go has it. You yep. can, all of the paid you know, add-ons and stuff, uh, features and all those sorts are, of things. Yeah. Those are basically NFTs. That's that. When I first started learning about NFTs, that was the first thing that popped in my mind. It's like, oh, this just reminds me of like digital assets you would buy on a game on your phone or something. Um, which is something that has been uh, sort of building. So people talk about, sometimes people talk down on crypto because they're like, oh, it's like gambling and all these things. And I'm like, what do you think is happening in these games where you can literally buy, you know, for instance, uh, one game I like to play from back in the day that I downloaded on my phone not too long ago was SimCity. Uh, and I was like, oh, right. it'd be cool to play SimCity again. I hadn't played that in forever. And then you see like, you know, oh, I can spend $10 and I get, credits for this game to then spend to like you know basically progress through the game faster is essentially right. what it does and i'm like okay so if i just had a bunch of money i could dump it into this game and i would get to the end faster you know and and could do all of these things you know it's like people don't think twice about that sort of stuff um but right. then when it's involved in like cryptocurrency and everything people start to get weird about it but this has already been happening right. for a long time and all blockchain does is provide an auditable record so that right uh, security is theoretically higher that the activity of these platforms is theoretically decentralized so that right you everyone that's participating is also controlling the functions of these systems depending on how they're set up and um yeah and you can all there's never any doubt of what you own and where it came from and it makes uh right. you know uh counterfeiting things more challenging because you can see who generated that digital asset and right. um so uh it's all of those little pieces that really excite me and why i think you know i think one of the limiting factors are gas fees you know the fact that you have to pay yeah to get something transferred to somebody is challenging. Um, but I think that's a very limited thing because um, blockchains are being updated. Ethereum 2 is coming out. Um, right. a, a blockchain I've been really looking at a lot lately is Algorand um, because they, uh. they're, one, they're already supposedly carbon neutral and their goal is to be carbon negative, uh, however nice. that works. Um and mm. then uh, their their fees are quite low now. If Algorand were right. to skyrocket in value, um, that could potentially change. Um, but it's also one of these that's relatively stable. It's not a stable coin, but it generally it, like it doesn't shoot. It's not as volatile as a lot of other cryptos. So that's got me really interested because I'm like, okay, if we can overcome the gas fee problem, 
and if we can make the environmental impact of operating on blockchain systems, you know, much better, um, then you start to see the doorway to mainstream acceptance. Um, right. Because, because then you can come up with applications and things where people can interact with them the same that they've interacted with other applications. They don't really think about all of these barriers to entry. And right. then I think the benefits start to become just very overwhelming and obvious to see. Um, and like you're, you're right. talking about, like, spar like parsing out ownership, fractional uh, stake in physical assets and digital assets. Like, that's going to take people a little while to understand and think about. Right. But that's absolutely one of the biggest things that has me excited about it. And I don't know if you've seen Gary V. He's been hyping yes. up uh, May 5th. I have no idea what he has planned, but uh, apparently yeah. May 5th. May 5th is supposed to be really good for crypto. Yeah, and he, in general, I don't know. Part of me wonders if he's going to do something like this, if he's going to offer some sort of fractional ownership in something of his and, and right. do it through NFTs. Um, but I think that's going to be a big, big way that NFTs are going to be used in the future as far as like where all the big money is going to go. It's going to go in, I think, right. fractional ownership of assets that have been hard to have fractional ownership over before and IP. So just, be, I mean, like patents, they should be on blockchain. Yeah. I mean, like right. it just makes sense, uh, you know, different things right. like that. Uh, company IP, even if it's not patented, um, you could put on blockchain and th that could actually give you quite a bit of protection as far as the traceability auditability if you're going to right. if you're going to sell your company or something you know uh being able to just transfer crypto assets to another entity and then that's done there's no debate over who owns what what's what it's just all there you know moved over right um Legally, it's, it's almost like secure. notarized already. Exactly. Well, and that's I think that's the thing is that blockchain really eliminates so many middlemen that would normally be there for security purposes, uh, witnesses and notaries, even banks, um, right? Lenders, you know, all these different things. It it makes them largely irrelevant. And I'm hoping within the next ten years or so, people will really start to s understand that. Um, but right. uh, the, yeah, the NFT boom, maybe that's going to be the thing that really gets blockchain accepted um, right. widely. But I'm, I'm excited that you're participating in that. And um, I'm interested to see where it goes. I've got like, um, well, technically several hundred of these Canacard NFTs minted, um, but that's including copies. And I think that's a right. big misunderstanding if people don't understand that you can actually have multiple copies um of these tokens but the the key is that the number of copies that are allowed is embedded in the blockchain so like right. there can never be copies made of the copies right and i, I try to tell people it's kind of like artwork prints it's like you could right. have the the original or you could get a print which is still highly valuable maybe that's like you know signed by the artist or whatever right um, and there's a limited number of runs that they did or whatever but um right yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. And that unlockable content, that's that's going to be huge. So, um, yes, 100%. Uh, hopefully people listening, we, like, go check it out. Yeah, I mean, literally, like, it can be applied for uh, to everything from, you know, like, equipment manufacturers transferring a warranty. Yes, like if, yeah. Uh, people, you know, like, there's, uh, I'll, I'll give them a shout out, uh, Busy, Busy Beast mm -hmm. Extractors. Um, you know, they, they have some very high quality equipment. Depending on the, the size of the setup, you know, it can range anywhere from 30 to quarter million, depending yeah. on if you have the full C1D1 build out and everything like that. Um, and but they are attempting to offer um, like warranties on NFT. I'm pretty damn positive I was reading it on their page. If not, free idea. No, I'm pretty sure I read it on their page. Um, but you know, when it comes to like a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment, if somebody's selling it to another, yeah. like you know, you want that GC. Um, yep. It would be awesome that like, oh, we lost the warranty. Oh, we don't have a paper document anymore. Right. It's like, let's transfer ownership via blockchain. It's proven where it came from. It's proven where it's going. And, you know, the manufacturer can be like, oh, this isn't some yep. Chinese made steel that has been, you know, whatever. Not like manufacturers couldn't tell their own work, but just like. It just eliminates any, any potential, you know, any weirdness. It just makes it right. very straightforward. 
Right. And, you know, like, you know, like you're saying, the, the pro- people's problem with like the uh, environmental impact of mining operations and it's crypto already here. It's already happening. You know, that energy is being used. If you're not going to use the token, somebody else is going to use the token. And it's not it's it's more of an infrastructure problem that yeah, we have yeah. with our method of producing electricity. Yep. You know, we burn here in Lakeland, we burn coal. Like you can drive by the coal plant and it's like a hundred, a few hundred yards, like a few hundred feet tall, piles of coal. Yeah. And, you know, heat, there is, uh, it's very small, you know, there's uh, nuclear radiation in that, in that soot. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole reason why like people are terrified of nuclear power and stuff like that is because the investors that are the ones sponsoring this project, they're like, okay, what's the minimum we can invest for the maximum ROI? Right. Three yep. layers of protection. That's a minimum that should, that we can do four. That'll be enough. Like yep. we could make things so robustly safe energy production wise. Yeah. It, it wouldn't help out the investors a whole bunch, but that's they why still make money. <laughs> they still make money. They still make money, but you know, it's not that, yep. that percentage return. So it's, you know, there's definitely, and you know, solar power as, as that gets more and more widely accepted. And I mean, Florida, it's, we should have like solar panels on every damn corner, you know? Right. Um, and, but you know, so like there's, it's a, it's a logistics problem with like our energy infrastructure rather than it is like, Hey, crypto is wasteful, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and newer blockchains are like the coders are figuring out more efficient ways to code, which there's a limitation on that. They can only get so efficient. Um, right. And then you need a new programming language to try to oversimplify, you know, to simplify uh, things further. But, um, y- you know, it is one of these things that I think um, with possibly even within five years, certainly within 10 years, I don't think the energy consumption issue associated with crypto is really going to be uh, much of a valid argument against it i think it's just one of these things we see with early technologies um where there are all sorts of barriers to entry and little by little they're getting addressed and what can be addressed without changing uh how power is handled is through the coding and everything and also the allocation of research uh, resources around the world because since these things are decentralized depending on where uh the computing power is being applied to you know, process these transactions and everything, you can change the 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 impact that way. Um, so yeah, I, I I I've seen some funny responses on some of the articles about NFTs that have come out recently, where people are like, "Oh, this is BS. It'll never go mainstream. Like, you know, it's bad for the environment. All these things." I'm like, "You just sound like someone being critical of early technology." And right. It's like these are problems that are not permanent problems and right. like very much so not permanent problems, like to the point that I like I could be pleasantly surprised. And maybe in two or three years, most of those issues will be dealt with. Um, right. You know, and you, know, you, you were saying that you kind of brought up a point um, like when it comes to like, you know, having a signed piece of artwork by a, an artist, you know, typically people will make prints they'll make maybe 200, you know, a limited amount. Right. Um, and then they ship them. But, you yeah. know, if you want to talk about environmental impact let's go ahead and also talk about what does it take to print the material what you know what kind of ink and chemicals are used what's the packaging made out of if it's an art piece it's probably like surrounded by styrofoam and all sorts of plastic and other stuff that's generally not recyclable in most like city systems and stuff um and then shipping each one to individual people's door you know the gas and everything that's used for that you know like when we when we look at things that way like as consumers it's consumption is like overall not amazing for the environment you know what i'm saying yeah. but it's like whatever we can do i'd almost rather have um something that's not going to fill the landfill and yeah. mm-hmm. take up literal, literal valuable space on this planet and uh you know, no manufacturing harms, not people being sick in the local printing area because it's cheaper to live there and stuff. Um, and even, you know, like uh, when it comes to 
I don't know how to say it. Um, like when it comes to making these uh, wasteful pieces, um, I, I guess I guess like yeah, kind of down at that point. What what I'm thinking of actually is like you know money and stuff. Like also applying it to like a store of value or uh, like a currency. Um, you know, it's like dollar bills, they're paper. It's literal, literal paper. It's not backed right. by gold, you know, but we attribute value to it. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that other people want it. And just because it's technically worthless doesn't mean it's useless, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, and, you know, that the thing with currency is, you know, like people are like, oh, you know, crypto is going to kill cash. And, you know, I, <laughs> We'll, we'll always have we'll always have physical means of barter. We'll always we'll find something, even if like the U.S. dollar was to tank and the euro tanked or something, we would find something new. Like the yep. people would adopt. And and, and, and and historically, like that's what humans have done. We create tokens of value when we need right. to. Right. Right. It used to be wampum beads, food, you know, and you know, money, cash, fiat works well as a store of value for. You know, I can grow some weed, make some hash, and sell that for cash, which acts as a placeholder for me to, yep. instead of trading hash for food, you know, I can use that as a in the inter intermediary. Um, but you know, like it's 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 about what we assign value, and you know, especially with the internet or with like society uh, after the pandemic, things becoming more digital. You know, so many more like zooms and podcasts and yep. stuff like that that. Um, we're starting to get like virtual presence, yeah. you know, like yeah. uh, virtual avatars almost. We're not, yeah. we're yeah. definitely not there, but it's it will come, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's in, it's been in science fiction. It's been in. Have you books, played? Movies. Have you played around on Decentraland at all? Um, I have some of the tokens. Um, I have some of the coins or whatever, Mana. but um, I haven't. Yeah, yeah, the man. Oh yeah, yeah, you should you uh, should uh, poke around on there just because like talking about like the virtualization of our lives and everything you know i don't know if decentraland will be the the end all you know be all representation of this but the the spirit of decentraland is fascinating and i, I actually spend quite a bit of time roaming around in decentraland because there's a lot there to look That's at cool. um the metaverse the metaverse yeah but you start kind of recognizing okay like the future of the internet is three-dimensional yeah. and you know and we're going through this weird intermediary process where we are really digitizing life in all of its forms like and we've been going through this for so long i mean think about like music uh on its route to mp3s you know like right. vinyl and and cassette tapes and and cds and then finally you know digital files and now like no one has like physical representations of music anymore and movies have now gotten right. that way like very few people are actually buying dvds anymore or even right. buying blu-rays you just don't need to it's all information that you you know have access to well nfts is the next step of all of that of no let's take pretty much everything and push <laughs> it and did anything that can be digitized push it into uh the virtual world and decentraland is so fascinating because you know you're talking about virtual real estate you know, it's basically this area in this world, this metaverse that has these little um, sort of pockets of public space on them. Uh, and then surrounding all of that, you have private, quote unquote, land, literally L-A-N-D. It's an acronym. I can't remember what it stands for, but it is virtual land that people buy with real money. And they either then develop that land which right. means uh, in some cases building video games on it or building an NFT art gallery or right. a communal space, whatever, or they marketplace. Rent... To sell right. Whatever. whatever. You have physical... Yeah. And it has a three dimensional form, you know, that people are with their avatars actually interacting with these things, or they take that land and then they rent it or sell it. Um, but like all of these dynamics, it's all happening. Um and it is super interesting to think about that, you know, in a generation or two where like virtual reality technology has really caught up and all these other things like going online is going to be more like just entering the metaverse and doing things more so than it is getting on a screen and typing things, right. you know, 
and it's just it's just so crazy and fascinating to like witness that and be cognizant of what's happening that all the stuff with nfts it's just a natural evolution of our technology that's leading to this you know very much virtualization of our lives which ultimately and i'm so glad you brought this up ultimately can be a very positive thing for our environment uh just in that like okay if we can get rid of as many physical things as possible that we don't need you know um that's that can actually be a huge step towards you know trying to compensate for the damage we've done through you know our our sort of industrial revolutions and everything to get to where we are now um so it's just stuff i i geek out on big time because i just philosophically i find this super fascinating and really really exciting where this is all going right i know and you know like uh Obviously, though, we're, I, I'm very bullish and positive on the concept of NFTs and, like you said, virtualization of so many things. Um, but I feel like I love being devil's advocate, even yeah. about stuff that I care about. Yep. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it kind of reminds me of and I see why some people are like more hesitant to uh, adopt it because they're afraid of like they're afraid of centralization they're like oh what's online everything i can do can be tracked uh, mm-hmm. you know uh and not even like that necessarily but like um people being like oh you know i don't want like a, a digital fingerprint or mm-hmm. you know something that could uh you know whatever be dehumanize yeah Yep. You know yep, what I'm saying? Yep. I, I, can, I can see why people would be afraid of a of reality becoming more digital because, you know, I could see arguments to where, you know, if if it was so popular that people would be urged to stay inside and only be right, on a right. reality. That's never going to happen because human beings are too fucking crazy. Like, and, we and literally, I, like, we can yeah. be controlled that way. I, I totally agree. You know, we saw the pandemic. And- and I think like uh, augmented reality is also something that uh, will continue to be taken advantage of that will actually encourage people to interact with their physical environments. Right, right. And I mean, you know, you saw it in Pokemon. People love that. Like yeah. on the Pokemon Go app, people were freaking out. They made the Harry Potter one. Um, people really like that. And, you know, like the the, the thing is that it, 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 sound, it can sound scary, but also – you know, like there's there's this channel on YouTube I love. You'd probably love it. It's called um, Kurskasaga. Kurskasaga. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a German word, um, so I can't. It's K U R Z S E G A G T. I think Kurskasaga is basically. Okay. Uh, it's a it's weird spelling. Um, but it's basically like a little animated series where they will discuss a whole bunch of different things like why haven't we made we made contact with aliens yeah what would happen if we uh uh, set off every nuclear bomb on the planet at the same time like (laughs) it's got some really cool stuff like what would happen if a bacteria was the size of a whale all very wow wow yeah yeah, deep deep scientific concepts and um but you know one of them is like it's called a matryoshka brain and Mm -hmm. it's a you know fictional concept that if we were able to produce the right amount of energy and basically plug ourselves into like an augmented reality, we could, especially, you know, like Neuralink and stuff like that, like the ability to re-experience your first time smoking weed or your first yeah. kiss mm-hmm. or your first time jumping it's out of a plane. the experience machine. Uh, uh, philosopher it's, Robert Nozick brought that up a long time ago concept of like what do we what are uh what are some of the like ethical and philosophical issues once we get to that point where we can relive memories or create uh fictional experiences that feel as real you know as they could possibly feel right it's definitely um you know it goes into the territory of like transhumanism yeah yeah, yeah, um sounds very terrifying but you know like and there will always be people that try to take advantage, but you know, for the most part, humans are so innovative, and we we find so many. We're such good problem solvers that you know, I really feel like something like that would be not used because people escape reality however they want. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. People do it with video games. Like 
people do it already with video games. There are yeah. whole like Sim avatar, not even like the Sims games, but you know, like whole online areas where people have been going with their online mm -hmm. virtual avatars already. And, um, you know, choosing to spend their time in the video game as opposed to in the real world. And we don't tell them like or some people do, um, you know, don't play video games, do something else with your life. But like for the most part, we just tolerate let, it. Let, we tolerate. Let other people, let people enjoy things, you know, like, you know, people are freaking out. The Pokemon Go, it's a great yeah. example. People were like pissed about yeah, yeah. adults playing Pokemon. They're like, why are you 30 and playing Pokemon? It's like, because <laughs> I've been playing it since I was like eight. Right. So and it's not <laughs> like I spent my whole life doing it, but you know, it's like, let people enjoy things. Like let yeah. people have a good time. And you know, like if we can use augmented reality and Neuralink and uh, all these uh, budding technologies to like decrease suffering and increase happiness, why wouldn't we, you know? Yeah. Like if you have uh, nerve pain or something and you can uh, slightly change your perception of it and right unknown way why wouldn't you yep. you know like well and like think about the fact that like what does it mean to be human to have the human experience you know like all we experience is digital anyway we experience what our brains produce we don't experience reality right. uh, you no, know no. we don't no, we don't we are slaves to what our brains produce and um and in that way you know in this funny way the virtualization of all of these things is sort of just a way of us starting to do what we know, which is to create a, a filtered version of reality that, you know, right. we have experiences with. Like that's sort of like the bottom, right. the baseline of, of, of what it means to be human is we have experiences and, right. you know, and that's, that's really all we have. And, and obviously that that's a very like metaphysical, you know, claim yeah. to make and everything, but, but I'm, I'm serious in another, you know, sense of that, like, you know, when you really boil things down, you can never get outside of your brain. Um, nope. the, the only reasons we agree on things in science is because we assume that other people that seem to have brains and experiences, we assume they're real people and that their experiences right. are real and we can compare experiences and make predictions and things. Um, but even that can be thrown into doubt. I mean, my undergraduate degree before I got into science was in philosophy. So this is stuff I've spent oh, cool. quite a bit of time writing about and thinking about and stuff. And, you know, some of these basic issues, like we sort of dismiss them and ignore them for most of our lives because they're not super helpful for us surviving. I mean, really, right. you know, just right. evolutionarily, it doesn't, it's not very helpful to lapse into solipsism and, and be uncertain whether everyone around you is real or not. So we just right. assume everyone is and, <laughs> and right. move on. Um, but you know, there are these base issues of consciousness and, and our human experience that the digitiz digi digitization stuff really makes us confront head on and makes us ask these questions of like, yeah, what are we? What is our experience? And what is natural? What does natural mean? Right. You know, all these different things, you know, is the virtual world really that unnatural? Well, humans created it and we're natural. Right. We're products of life as it's evolving. Yeah. Um, so it has organic come from us yeah so, from our human nature yeah we are an expression of of life that has organized information and things together and and now this exists and this is you know so i don't know this is this stuff i, I really enjoy and I, I like writing like sci-fi fiction i've got a novel i've been working nice. on for years that oh I hope, cool i hope to finish one day that like kind of awesome uh explore some of these ideas but it's it's Super I love fascinating. Man. Yeah. And definitely, I definitely what got me into science. Yeah, me too. It's just and thinking about these sort of thought experiments. Um, you know, and science was just a an expression of like, well, I want to poke around and experiment and try to understand the world better. And uh, my my company, Natural Learning Enterprises, you know, the way I, I pitch it to people is like our focus is not just on science education, but science and philosophy education, because I view them as complementary disciplines in that Science gives you tools to evaluate your experience so that you can make predictions that are fairly reliable. Um, and philosophy right. is really a, gives you tools to critically evaluate your ideas and beliefs 
to try to make them more consistent um, with your experiences and, you know, and other things. And without them, you know, without them together, you end up with sort of a fragmented kind of uh, state of being. If, If you're all science and no philosophy, then you can spend all of your life dealing with predictions um, without ever zooming out to think about like, you know, other, you know, uh, implications of, of these predictions and everything like that. And, and without uh, science, obviously you can get wrapped up in ideas and beliefs without any, you know, uh, and be totally divorced from uh, your, I hate to say reality, but your experience and and the predictions that that can come with that. And so merging those two together is something I'm, I'm very passionate about that. uh, I know we're spinning off into things totally unrelated to anything we meant to talk about today. I love it though. Yeah, I do too. I mean, this is, I just, this is really uh, fascinating for me. And one reason why I, I get so passionate about um, educating in general is just to carve out space to be able to explore ideas and, and all these things and to try to, uh, loop it all together. Um, but I, I do, I do have to cut us off because we've been going for almost Absolutely. three hours and my, uh, my platform's probably going to stop recording any second here. Sure. Um, so <laughs> yeah, well, one thing I just want to add to that, check it out. It sounds like you already have, but there's a really good YouTube video. It's called how your brain hallucinates conscious reality. Yes. yes I have seen that. And yes. You've seen that. Um, and, you know, it literally just goes into like how our brains are prediction de- uh, devices. Like, you know, if we see a uh, object in front of a light colored object, our brain will literally put a shadow over it because of our yep, yep. prior experiences that an object in front of light casts a shadow. Yep. And, you know, I mean, like all these, uh, you know, what do you call it? Like the the eye tricks or whatever you call, yeah. you know, well, there's like the classic yeah, I, one that we uh, did, and I remember one of my psychology classes back in the day where you have people playing a basketball game or something, and then someone in a gorilla suit walks by, and at, at least yes. half the class or more won't have seen the gorilla at all. Right. Um, and, and then right. When, you, when you say, did you see the gorilla, they're like, what are you talking about? And then when you slow it down and rewind it, people are just amazed, like, how in the world did my brain not perceive this yeah. big furry creature <laughs> walking through yeah. the court um and, yeah, and the your guy, eyes like, are not cameras no they're not cameras and memories memories are not replays of cameras either uh, right they're constructed and um mm-hmm. that's brain what... stuck inside this bone all we have are these electrical signals coming in that are putting predictions outwards yep it's, I mean, you know, like that's why people have a, you know, hallucinations is like a uncontrolled thought and yeah. a uh, reality is like a controlled hallucination, you know? Yeah, yep, um, absolutely. And one this that, was a great conversation though. Yeah, this has been really, really great. And I'm, I'm glad that we finally have directly connected and, and especially, you know, not all podcast episodes are able to go for over an hour or so, but it's nice that this one was able to go long and that we could really spin out and all sorts of stuff. We kind of got all of the hash rosin stuff in the first hour and a half and yeah. then, uh, spin out into other interesting things here. But um, yeah, man, this has been a really great conversation. I appreciate you Absolutely. being willing to take the time today um, to talk for this yeah. long. And yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And yeah, everyone listening, go check out Botanic <clears throat> Botanic Chemist. Um, and that's, that's your name across platforms, right? Cause it's like IG. Or... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I use it on everything. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I have Ouroboros laboratories, which is on IG, but again, that's just kind of like on the side right now, you know, I've been focusing on the hash and the consulting and, um, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm on. Like pretty much it. IG, um, I'm on LinkedIn now. I just go by my name, Jonathan mental on there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pretty much. Yep. Yeah. And you know, I'm trying to, you know, anything like, you know any new platforms that you're on especially stuff that is like focused on education like please let me know because totally. i have a lot of content to migrate you know so nice yeah absolutely and that's that's actually something i'm really um starting to try to to find resources for because we just launched our online learning platform at natural learning enterprises and we're using curious about cannabis as kind of the um the first uh sort of test entity <laughs> to kind of see right, how it goes right. so, so we've been building um some cannabis education content um mostly off of stuff that i've given lectures on about in the past and stuff basic botany and chemistry stuff um but i would love to um co- 
collaborate with people that that have content that they want to share especially sort of my pitch is is if you have content you know i'm an educator i'm formally trained i can take whatever you have and mold it into something that i think will work really really well as an online course or as a component to a workshop or whatever and so i'm really exploring all of that so absolutely if you're um if you've got some some stuff like that that you want to work together on totally happy to do that and and um you know we've been talking about collaborating on nfts and stuff too um yes definitely especially after this conversation i'm definitely looking forward to collaborating any way we can yes come up with so 100 percent. yeah i'm i'm super down and i'm super down um i mean literally like all the things we talked about that and i feel like there's just more and more possibilities of nfts coming online like you know people are like oh what if we do this with it oh yeah you know? and, i mean think about when tools get built that allow you to and that's sort of coming i don't know if you heard about ether cards um but ether cards are sort of this ambiguous nft project that claims that they will allow you it'll be a a tool system that allows you to do more interesting things with nfts and so people uh, they they were very expensive to get i did not get one but uh, Mm. if you got one of the initial offerings of these ether cards they're basically like a placeholder for you to get access to these tools that they're going to be putting out um, to do more interesting things with nfts that's why i'm like yeah this is so early and it's like the beginning of the internet man i mean it's like originally websites were like Te- all, all text-based and then they were like sort of crappy right. like really crappy backgrounds with like one of three fonts you know and they, they just yeah. evolved and now they're these big like multimedia productions and right. uh, nfts are going to go through similar technological evolutions and they're going to start out really simple as like these images and videos and stuff and it's going to become something that we can't even really imagine they'll take on graphical right. interfaces and stuff that it's going to, yeah, it's going to be really, really fascinating. But Right. Projection mapping, yeah. holograms, yeah. like all of these things are going to completely change that space. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be cool. Well, anyway, uh, keep me in the loop, everything that's, yes. that's going on with you. And, um, yeah, I look forward Likewise. to seeing how things uh, proceed. And whenever I make it down into the southeast, I'll make sure to hit you up. Yeah, man. Thank you, Jason. Absolutely. Yeah, just uh, we'll keep in contact, and uh, I'll be sharing this whenever uh, whenever it gets posted. So just just let me know. Yeah, it'll probably be two weeks. I think either okay, one cool. and a half or two weeks. I'm trying to push Perfect. things out a little faster than I used to. So um, I'll let you know. But with that, everybody, thanks so much for uh, tuning in. If you made it through this whole episode, Thank you. that's super super awesome. So uh, everyone, yeah. stay curious and take it easy. Bye bye. Thanks, Jason. See you. Thanks.